All right. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the former Action Guys podcast. Um, so I had someone else reach out to me. I think you you had purchased some stuff from my website a few times in the past. And then someone else reached out and said you had an organization. I didn't even know you were running a, a nonprofit organization. So if you want, go ahead and uh, you want to introduce yourself and kind of tell us where you're from and, and uh, why you joined the military. Yeah, so, uh, well, my name is Aaron Quinones, and I joined the Marines in 1997. I grew up in a small little mountain town in Northern California. Uh, really poor growing up out there, you know, didn't really have running water or electricity, you know, in my house. Um, I didn't really notice what poor was until I uh, started going to school and I started realizing like, oh, wow, people have electricity and, and, and uh, running water. Um, oh, you didn't have electricity so or got- running water? Yeah, no, not not growing up, uh, not until I was about seven or eight when we moved closer into town. So it's a small little town called Mad River, California. Mm-hmm. It's uh, up in Humboldt County, so it's a small mm. little hippie community, just yeah. hippies and loggers up there. A lot of a lot of pot farmers. You yeah, know? so that's uh, the the Emerald Triangle. You know, it's right there. Yes. Are, yes. So are you near that? So uh, are you near that mountain, that Murder Mountain that they made that documentary about? Yes, and yes, what you, what, I am. What, I live on the back side of that mountain. What so, are you, yes. What are your thoughts on that? Um, that's how I grew up, man. Uh, yeah. Honestly, that's they showed a, a small little snippet of what um, what that whole area was all about. It's it's a lot of outlaws and vagrants that lived up there. There's some good people too. Don't get me wrong. Some yeah, great yeah. people, but. If you were looking to go somewhere where you could disappear, that that would be it. Because I, I lived um, this place called Eight Mile. It still exists today, but it's a different generation of people that live there. Uh, there was a green gate, mm-hmm. and then past the green gate, it was eight miles till the end of the world. It just ended to Forest Service land. And so the only people who lived out there, or the only people who would go out there, were the people who owned property and lived there. Yeah. Uh, you didn't go past the green gate. E- yeah. Even the sheriff wouldn't go back back there. He, he would put a note on the gate that said, hey, so-and-so, come see me when you come into town. Uh, sheriff wouldn't even go back there because it was just uh, all outlaws and pot farmers. And back then, they had this group called uh, CAMP, California Agricultural Marijuana Patrol. And so every year in the fall, uh, they, would, they would fly these planes over uh, and they would run infrared and mm. the THC in marijuana would, would light up uh, bright. And so they would just plot that on a map. And a couple of days later, they'd bring in choppers with the sheriff's department. They'd fast rope in and yeah. get a bunch of the marijuana they'd find and, and they'd haul it out. And so they're still doing that's that. what I grew up doing. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, le- it's more legal now than it was back then. They're doing but, it for uh, people that don't have I the permits up. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so I've really seen that industry go from the Wild West to Main Street. Mm-hmm. And it's it's been remarkable to to kind of sit back and watch that happen. Um, so I have a unique perspective on that whole whole industry. Do you, but um, do you just because and I, I don't want to get like caught up in this documentary just be, but I, I really enjoyed watching that. Do you think that was like a pretty accurate documentary? Like was it I mean, so you're saying that that was a real portrayal, you know, like an accurate portrayal of people that are living up there. And, and I also agree with you that there's, I guarantee there's good people up there. Mountain communities are one of those things that kind of like desert communities. Like there's people that just want to get away from everybody else that move out into those areas. And that's just a natural kind of thing. So I'm not surprised that you have, you know, it's a little bit looser with how people are living on a mountain community. Right. Yeah. So these, uh, honestly, you know, I grew up out there, and and the people that live out there, they wouldn't fit really well into normal society. Hmm. They they just wouldn't. So they move out there to not be bothered, to live their own life and and not be bothered. Yeah. And so a lot of the violence that I saw growing up was because people didn't want to leave those people alone. That's uh, where yeah. we see violence. You know, I, and and there's a lot of drug use and alcohol. And my my opinion is that all those people were running from something, mm-hmm. whether it been from the law or their past or their parents or situations that they had gotten into. Um, looking back now, I can see that just about every adult that I knew as I grew up was dealing with some sort of trauma that they hadn't addressed, mm-hmm. and so it was easier for them to move out there and use drugs and alcohol 
where they could do that freely and nobody was judging them, nobody was stopping them, and they could just live their own life. But they were all really trying to run from trauma or trying to to deal with some trauma that they experienced in their life. And I could I can see that now as an adult mm-hmm. and working with veterans dealing with trauma that that's exactly what they were dealing. With. There are quite a few Vietnam veterans out there that uh, after I came back from Iraq, I got to go back and meet some of these guys and, and talk to them now, both us being war fighters and, and gleam a lot of really good information about uh, their experience and why they moved out there and how they've coped with their uh, PTSD over the years. Mm-hmm. So like I said, very perspective growing up out there. That's cool, man. That just, you know, it's just, that's the, uh, that's the cool thing about the United States is you have people from all walks of life, all different kinds of communities and and I've always told people like I think that's one of the greatest things about the military is that it's um, that diversity of not just like ethnicities that you meet but like the regionally diversity you know the regional diversity of the people you know you got people from I grew up in Tennessee for a while living by the river you know and then I moved to Indiana so I'm a midwestern southern kid and you know and I'm sitting there working with guys from New York City that never had a driver's license because they're why would they get a driver's license you know. They're like, I just take the subway everywhere. So it's like, and they just, so you have two different thought. It's cool just interacting with all those people and being exposed to those. So it helps you understand like, you know, the overall picture of the United States and the people that live in it. So that's cool that you have like your own, um, you know, interesting background. So, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know anything about you. Like, yeah, you got recommended to me for the podcast. So I know zero about you other than, uh, that you were at an Anglico and I thought you were at second Anglico, but I, would, I just I was just looking at something on you. Said you were at first Anglico, right? Yeah, yeah, I was in first Anglico, Camp Pendleton. Yeah, um, yeah, that's so. I I, I think uh, Leo is who reached out to you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So and well, so yeah, yeah. I, I worked with Leo. And if you ever get a chance, I'm not going to tell the story here. But if you ever get a chance, ask him if he's got any uh, any any Altoids. I'll and uh, uh, I'll it's, do a, that. it's a great. It's a great Story. I'll shoot him a message and it's see what he says. Um, so let's start <laughs> back. So what made you decide to join the military coming from a mountain town and, and, you know, like a different kind of upbringing? What was the like deciding factor? And did you have any persuasion or dissuasion from your family? You know, that's a, that's a great question. So I, I grew up, like I said, in, in the mountains of Northern California. And so I didn't have like access to really TV or cable TV or the movies or anything like that. You know, Mm -hmm. I I grew up in the wilderness. So, you know, we play outside or go to the lake or ride our bikes, stuff like that. But um, as far as like fast food and movies and stuff, I didn't have that kind of a childhood. Mm -hmm. I grew up just hunting and uh, fishing and and living off the land, literally living off the land. Um, So we because there's so much rampant uh, alcoholism and drug use, my, my dad, you know, was, was very abusive and uh, ended up kicking us out at one point. So it was, I remember it was me and my mom and I have three little sisters and we lived on the river uh, for about four months, um, homeless, just, just living on the river uh, in tents, trying to figure it out. And I think I was 12 at the time. My mom, she got some money together and ended up moving us to Coos Bay, Oregon. But while I was there in, in Mad River, I didn't have a lot of entertainment. So I would go to the library and I would read a lot. Mm-hmm. And I remember I would go to the National Geographics and I would I would read uh, National Geographic magazines all the time. And I would see these awesome places. I would see places like Egypt and Angkor Wat and the ruins, the Mayan ruins down in South America. And I'd be like, ah, I really want to see these places. You know, I just had a desire to travel and see all these amazing places that were on Earth. And um, when I when we moved to Coos Bay, Oregon, I, I knew that I didn't have a lot of opportunities. Um, college just didn't seem like a good fit for me. And so uh, the military seemed like a, a way that I could could get out and see the world. And when I looked at what branches of military I wanted to be in, I, I just I didn't know much about it because I didn't see a lot of advertisements on TV uh, growing up. So I just, I did some research to, you know, who, who was the baddest, uh, military force out there and hands down, it was the Marine Corps, you know, and I got some army buddies uh, that, uh, take offense to that, but it's the truth, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the way it is, you know? So I, I did, I joined the Marine Corps and I knew I wanted to go into communications because it was, uh, every m- military unit needs comm guys, mm-hmm. right? It's something that they got to have. So when I looked at what uh, 
what job I wanted to do. I wanted something that was flexible that I could go anywhere. And so I joined um, as a 2531, which they've changed the designator now to 0621. But yeah, I became a field radio operator. And when I was going through field operators course in 29 Palms, California, I had an instructor, Sergeant Love, uh, L-U-V, and he was in Anglico. And so he'd ask me questions every couple of days like, hey, Q, you, uh, you afraid of heights? No, oh, no. Okay. And then that'd be it. A couple of days later, like, you, uh, you want to jump out of airplanes? Yeah, it sounds fun. You know, so he'd ask me these questions and stuff like that. And uh, I didn't know at the time, but he had come from First Anglico, and he was doing his B billet out there in 29 Palms teaching uh, at the comm school. So when they shipped me over to Shrig, which is now MEF, he told me uh, when I go in front of the lieutenant, tell him that I want to go to Ang- uh, I want to go to Anglico, and he'd make sure that the the orders got pushed through. And so that's exactly what I did, and uh, I checked in, and I'll never forget the lieutenant's face. He said, "You know, they, they don't take uh, lance corporals in." in Anglico. Like, that's just not what they do. You got to be an NCO. I don't know anything about it. So he makes a couple calls. and I don't know. A couple hours later, a couple guys show up in a white van and pick me up and take me out to Anglico. And then I do the Anglico basic course and the rest is kind of history. You know, I got hooked up with one of the best units in the Marine Corps just by chance. No, that's good, man. That's awesome. That's, uh, I mean, they didn't take, they didn't take junior Marines at that time. What year was this? This was 97. That's what they were telling me. That's what the lieutenant at Shrig was telling me. Now, when I got there, that was, that was a, that was, a lot of that was true. I mean, I think there were only a couple other um, non-rates that were in there, only a couple other like E3s and below that, it, that were there. There wasn't a lot of us. We were definitely top head. I was going to say, isn't that a time when they took away First Anglico Actual by itself and it was it got merged into like the headquarters group as like just a platoon, like a small platoon and not a full company or did you, was there a full company there? So there are about 150 of us there. I was yeah. there when they okay. did the stand in 2000. So in 2000, when they stood down the unit, uh, I was there when they followed the colors, you know? So it was a very somber experience Yeah. Uh, when they said, ah, oh, we don't need the Anglico mission anymore. Boy, were they wrong, right? Yeah, when I left, there was about 160 people. Does that make sense? So that's the period I'm talking about is when they did the stand down. Because so when they when yeah. they stood them down, it didn't they just keep like a small group and they became like the meth, like something inside of the meth. So yeah, so what they tried to do is um, Lieutenant Colonel Bright. He, he left and went somewhere. I'm not sure where he ended up. But he was an amazing commander, but uh, they brought in a new guy. Um, Mettler, I believe his name was. And, and their idea was they wanted to call it the Marine Liaison Element. And yeah, so they took it. away jump status, they call for fire, and they just wanted to have linguists and comm guys. And basically, we would just act as some sort of like liaison with with the foreign military and governments. I, I don't know. It looked to me like it was more like a – I don't even know what they were trying to create, like some quasi-CIA – <laughs> you know, uh, branch where you didn't really have direct contact. You were just, uh, everybody had, you know, clearances and you were just basically passing crypto around or top secret documents. And so we had to go through these different like HRP courses and stuff like that. I'm not sure exactly what their design was. Um, but it, it, it obviously didn't, didn't work. Yeah, no, that's pretty wild. I, I think, um, you're the first person I've had on the show that was here before, that was at Anglico before they stood down. Uh, there's a bunch of guys out there. I've yeah, got a few feelers out uh, for some for some other guys. That's so. What was the feeling like joining the military in the mid '90s? Gulf War was over with, so like the stigma of the military from like Vietnam had kind of worn off, and the Gulf War had happened, and people came back. And I remember my dad was in the Gulf War. I actually posted a photo of it on uh, Instagram the other day. Um, of him leaving. And I remember him coming back and there were banners and like the whole town, you know, there were like fucking police escort. And like, it was like a huge thing. Like they were like, welcome home. You know, it was like a big deal. And, and I think the general public from what I've, as I've gotten older and I've looked back onto it and read about it and stuff, it, you know, people talk about how the general public kind of felt bad about how they treated Vietnam vets. So then they like threw all kinds of law, you know, I don't know, whatever at the, at the guys coming back from the Gulf War. So what was it like? What was it like joining the mid nineties? You're in, you're after the Gulf War. You obviously don't know you're going to get attacked, you know, within 
less than a decade by terrorists. What was that time? What was peacetime Marine Corps like? Because guys are getting ready to go into it. We just signed a, a you know, a peace deal with the Taliban. Dudes are going to be coming home from deployment. Like the, there's really no wars right now, right? We're going to be doing UDP rotations and stuff like that, which means going to Japan for those that don't. So, what should they expect? What's what's the uh, what's the lowdown on the peacetime Marine Corps? Uh, I just say training, 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 man. Get get schooled out. You know that's what we used to call it in Anglico. Get schooled out. So uh, it's funny because in the, in the Marine Corps, you've got you've got this certain group uh, of Marines that that want to tell you or any anybody in the military, don't volunteer for anything. Don't volunteer for anything. That's mm-hmm. what they say. Don't volunteer. Um, man, I'm in the exact opposite mindset. I say volunteer for everything. Mm-hmm. Everything you can do. You know, you raise your hand and I'll do it. And you get stuck with some crappy details. I mean, I know I did. I got stuck with some crappy details, but I wanted to go places and do things. I didn't want to sit there and PM radios and do, yep. you know. Fucking record uh, jackets all day. Games all day. Yeah, I'm not into that. I want to go places and do things. So it didn't matter what it was. I, I knew that I was just volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. And I got the reputation um, to, to be the guy that, that, that'll just do it. And I got stuck, you know, doing crappy details from time to time. But I also got to do some really cool stuff. You know, I became a master parachutist uh, in Anglico. Uh, I became the Naval Weapons Security Manager. So I, that that was that was really unique position. Uh, it's usually held by a captain. And here I was, a uh, corporal, doing the job. Hmm. Um, I've never even heard you know, what, I got to go through. What was the role of that position? What was it called? Naval Warfare what? It sounds really cool. Naval Weapons Security Manager. So basically, mm-hmm. I run all the crypto vaults. I handle all of the secret and top secret um, uh, documents coming through. I've got to go up to main side and I've got to do all the exchanges yeah, and gotcha. stuff like that. When people come in, I've got to run their SSBIs, their single scope background checks. I've got to pull police blotters every month to see if anybody's gotten in trouble, gotten married, do all that stuff. So um, it, it was really cool. I got to see a different side of, of of things other than just the tactical side. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to learn how to do call for fire in, in the Marine Corps. I got to go through close combat instructor course. Uh, the whole unit went through a, uh, uh, a, like a cold weather, a cold weather package up in Bridgeport, California. So just, I would just volunteer for as much as I could. And man, I got to do some really great stuff as where I have friends that were in the Marine Corps and they said their time sucked yeah. because they just sat on camp penalty and counted canteens yeah. but they didn't volunteer for it yeah so that's my advice to anybody who's coming in just volunteer man get schooled out 100 percent. i i say that all the time like volunteer for stuff but be smart about it like volunteer shape your own destiny like ask questions people yeah. are so afraid and you know part of the problem is is when you're a private or pfc or lance corporal like especially a newer lance corporal you don't know who to fucking talk to. You don't know who to ask about things. You don't know how to make things happen. Um, yep. And it's, it's so it is fucking tough and it sucks for the guys that do four years and you know, don't get to do anything cool and stuff like that. I had a buddy who was in, he got out in 2000. Uh, what do you say? 2008, I think is when he got out. So that means he was in from 2004, 2008, never deployed. You know, he, we were motor team mechanics and I get it. He was a mechanic and stuff like that. But in that whole time frame, he never got to travel anywhere and he never deployed. You know, he did one workup for deployment. They got pulled off the deployment right at the very end of the deployment or right before uh, they were getting ready to leave. And um, it's just like, dude, he didn't get to do anything cool. And you feel bad for those guys. You're like, dude, that. Yeah. Volunteering for stuff is definitely important. Um, So what kind of opportunities? So let's start. You, You got to Anglico. You said you did ABC. You did the Anglico basic course which is uh, something that was, I think it was held more to a standard at that point than it is now. Now it's more of like a, okay, hey, we have time to do it. Let's fucking, let's run an ABC course, run everybody through it. Um, or at least it was when I was there. Um, because literally I did, I never did one. I showed up, I showed up on Friday. I checked in on a Friday and then checked out on Monday to check into the Mew and start my workup for deployment, you know? So it wasn't like I had time to go do an ABC um, so what was it, what was it like doing or, or, or what was that like for you? What was the course like? Uh, honestly, it was intense. I mean, I started the ABC course, I want to say two weeks, maybe two weeks after I got to the unit. Okay. Um, it, it, it was, it was intense. I mean, it was PT every morning, studying, learning call for fire. We'd go out to red beach and do surf checks. I mean, it was like an, it was like an in doc, man. It was a, a, a pass or fail deal. Um, where if you couldn't cut it, they would just send you back to ninth com or send you somewhere else. You know I mean? They, 
they had this attitude of um, uh, either you're going to make it or you're not, Mm -hmm. you know? And so there were guys that just, if you were complaining about an injury, they would send you, they would cut your orders to another unit so you could get well, you know, but yeah. you're not coming back kind of, thing. which was fine for me at the time. Cause I didn't, I didn't know anything else. Right. I mean, I show up, this is, I'm under general crew lack. Okay. And, um, so it's the, the kinder gentler Marine Corps was, was the motto, right? Oh, really? Where there's not supposed to be me after, um, uh, after boot camp and all of those things. And I remember I checked into Anglico and I'm in my alphas and uh, I'm reporting and I'm, I'm, you know, getting trashed in my alphas doing push ups and sit ups. And I'm like, they said that this stuff didn't happen in the fleet, but I just, <laughs> whatever, kept my mouth shut and, you know, did the push ups, played the games that they wanted me to play. And it, it was fine. I mean, it, it was not to the point where they're causing me bodily harm or anything like that. You just, you play the game until you, you rate and then, uh, and then you don't got to do it anymore. You well, know, what- if you do, if you weren't airborne, in Anglico during that time, then it didn't matter what your rank was. You got the crappy jobs. You know, you weren't allowed to go in the paraloft. Every time you uh, entered somebody's uh, hatch, you had to pound the hatch and, and, and holler, you know, leg on deck. I mean, just stuff like that. You, you definitely oh, knew. Really? <laughs> you, oh, yeah. You definitely knew who the uh, who the alphas in the company were. And, and when you first get there, you are not. You know, you've got to earn that. And, and you know, I, I eventually got to that point and was able to do it. But, uh but yeah, so that's that was that was my experience. The guys that I served with were awesome. A lot of them had spent time in, in the Gulf. Um, you know, one of my greatest mentors, uh, Carl Simberger, he uh, he taught me a lot. You know, and so that's another thing for these junior guys coming in. Look at your staff NCOs and see. You can see the guys that are are doing the bare minimum to, mm-hmm. to get by, and just steer clear of those guys. And you see the other guys out there that are motivated, that are doing the extra things, that are being helpful. Yeah. The ones, guys. Yeah, guys, the ones that are a positive piece to the community. That's right. That's right. Follow those guys. If you ever see one of your NCOs uh, talking trash about the command, like, you know, don't confront them. Just steer clear of that guy. That's not the guy that you want to try and emulate. You want the guy that's out there that's going to, um, you know, support the command and support the the, the mission and, and not the not the detractors. So, yeah. I, oh, I mean, I guess it depends on the command. <laughs> I was the detractor yeah. guy at the eleventh view on my way out. I was like, "Fuck this, the mu sucks." People are checking in. I'm, I'm, I'm the dude. Like, good luck, have fun out there, you know. But I had, I did yeah. just get off ship where I got off like three times on the entire deployment. So, um, when you were, um, when you got to Anglico, did did they send you straight to the S six to the comm section, and and did you have to like work there for a little bit before they put you on a team, or how was the how was that for you guys? Yeah, so I, I, I was, um, I was, but like I said, after just a couple of weeks, they, they sent us straight into that Anglico basic course and we did that. And from there they started dividing guys out. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember my first job was the battery NCO. <laughs> I was in charge of just batteries, man. Yeah. But, uh, I look back now and I'm like, that was actually a super dangerous job. <laughs> the yeah. batteries that we had back then, they would vent, they would explode. Some of them were magnesium batteries so if they get wet those things would catch on fire so you know um i didn't know anything at the time they just gave me these manuals these turnover manuals said here you're in charge of the batteries and good luck yeah. <laughs> so it, it was uh, it, it seems like a menial task but at the time it was super super overwhelming for me um and i stayed with calm for for a very long time i went through my schools i liked working I like working in calm. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you were on a team, it didn't really matter because when the, when when we we'd go out, the whole unit would go out. The headquarters unit went out with uh, all the FIC teams and assault teams to go do 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 missions. You know, everybody went to the cast trainer. Didn't matter what, if you were in, if you were in Motor T, if you were in S two, S three, S one. It didn't. It just didn't matter. Mm-hmm. You everybody learned. Uh, had a call for fire. Everybody went to the um, uh, OP Alpha and called in air. Uh, everybody did that. Everybody was in that rotation. Uh, and so you'd get put on a team, and then sometimes they'd swap you out and move out to uh, working whatever your primary job was. But they, they would do that. Everybody was schooled up on those things. The other thing that was really cool is they would send a couple guys to go get certified for, like, mount training. Mm. And then they would bring them back, and then they would take the whole unit, and we'd spend a week 
at the mount facility doing those drills you know i mean so that was that's where i think anglico really set itself apart from the other units that i experienced was that everybody in the unit went and did training lieutenant colonel bright didn't just send the teams out i mean he sent all of us out to bridgeport california to do cold weather training he took all of us out to big bear to do um a big mountain warfare training out there everybody went unless yeah. unless you were broken uh, everybody went. And that's one thing that talking with these other guys who are in different units, they didn't have that kind of experience. You know, if they were in a support role, that's what they were in. But yeah. in Anglico, there, there was, there, there was real no clear lines of, of who was support and who wasn't because everybody knew the job. So. Yeah. that That's kind yeah, of changed. Um, it's you still as a support guy, like, so I would take out the drivers all the time. I'm like, hey, bring all your shit because when we're going to the range, you're shooting with us. You're not just – because a lot of units, if you're a seven-ton driver or whatever, you're a truck driver, you drive out there and fucking let everyone out of your truck and then they sit in the cab and don't do anything. You know, they just fucking chill. And I'm like, dude, fuck that. First time one of my drivers came out when I got there, he, he came out. We had a new kid. I remember – oh, what was his name? There was a kid named Pine and, a, and another kid. Ah. Oh. I don't remember. Anyway, they came out and they were both PFCs, just got there from MOS school, and both of them had slick flax. And I'm like, fuck no. I was like, next time you fucking come out here, you better have all your shit put together, you know, your magazines on, everything ready to go, like ready to shoot because you're bringing, and like they didn't even have their rifles. I'm like, dude, you guys are fucking shooting with us. Like we're bringing all this stuff out and you guys, and you know, a lot, you, like you said, a lot of units don't get that kind of opportunity. The problem now is that it's, the actual head shed people don't normally go out and do stuff. The CEO will come out and stuff like that. Or if there's like a big exercise, they'll all go out. But I think because of the type of deployments that Anglico has been doing, where it's like, you know, I need one. A lot of times, honestly, they're like, hey, I need the JTAC from this fict, and that's it. But, you know, if not that, they're getting deployed as a fict to go operate on their own, you know, like they should be. And the training has pulled more away from the big picture, big Anglico, everyone out there doing it together to, you know, small team skills and stuff like that. And, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's a bad thing or if it's a good thing, you know, like, I think that's kind of the whole shifting with the, with the battle, what's going on. So what are your thoughts on yeah. that? You know, I, I'm not really sure cause I haven't seen, I haven't seen the other side. I, I did, um, you know, 97 to, to 01 and Anglico disbanded. I knew I didn't want to go. I knew I didn't want to go to uh, st stay with the, the Marine liaison element. It was not what I was interested in. If I think if I, if Anglico didn't disband, I, I would have stayed in a lot longer. Yeah. But I got out in, in, uh, in, in 2002, a good friend of mine, Brian Bertrand, he, he was killed in Afghanistan uh, when a C-130 went down mm. and, and we went to high school together. I mean, I recruited this guy into the Marine Corps. And so it was really tough on me. Um, I struggled with that for a long time. And, uh, then when the, when I knew the war was kicking off in Oh three, I, I volunteered to go. So I was already out. I was already out. I was living in Seattle and uh, I volunteered. I said, I'm going with the next unit that's, that's heading out. And it happened to be the six engineers. And so I attached to them. Um, you know, they knew my skill set. They saw what I could, you know, so you, my SRB, what I could do. So, so. you came back in, did you have to go through any kind of yeah. training or anything or, or did you switch up jobs? You were still a radio operator? Still, still radio operator. And so what they had me running was a uh, retrans site for the six engineers. So they would basically leapfrog, you know, we breached the border and then they would send a couple elements forward and we'd set up comms and then the main body would move up just a little bit past us to mm -hmm. set up a base camp. And then we would leapfrog back in front of them and do the same thing. And so we'd have these, they were pumping bulk fuel and water from the border all the way up uh, through these, they call it the hose reel. So it's a hose reel and there's big bladders. And they would fill up with fuel and then they would pump it to the next station and pump it to huh. the next station. And so I ran a retrans site making sure communications was out there uh, for everybody. So I spent a lot of time in the desert um, alone, honestly. And I look back on it now and uh, what they did, it, it, it's, uh, it was horrible. You know, I mean, um, <laughs> They should have had me out there with a team of guys. And they did in the beginning because that's what I requested. But as we got longer in the tooth and the mission got longer, uh, they started pulling guys from me. And so there were times where I spent, you know, days or weeks out there by myself uh, waiting to get resupplied or waiting what? for somebody else to, to come. Uh, what what yeah, part of so Iraq? Was, uh, so we went from 
from Kuwait, we went all the way up. We were running parallel to the third ID. So we went all the way up through like Al Nazaria. And then that's basically where I stopped. And then they pushed all the way into uh, 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 Baghdad. But I, I wasn't part of the element that pushed forward past Al Nazaria. I stayed right there. Um, Running that, running that retrans site, making sure comms were up. And I tell you, what, I don't want to embarrass the six engineers too much, but man, it was. Uh, I, I I honestly believe that 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 reserve units should not. Um, that if you're going to go in the reserves, you should have to do active duty time first, mm-hmm. because the guys that I was working with, they're great guys. They just didn't have enough wrench time in their job to be proficient yeah. in what they were doing. I yeah. mean, just making seriously bad mistakes. I remember. Um, I could hear these guys on the radio, but nobody was answering up. Nobody was answering up. And this lasted for about a day. And I was like, okay, something's going on with their comms. So they're not answering back to me. Right. And so I drive back in, I leave my Lance corporal and my corporal out there and I drive back in and I'm like, they start yelling at me like, well, why aren't you answering up on comms? What's going on? I said, well, we're, we're hearing you fine. Like what? I I don't, I don't know. We're getting calm with everybody else, but you, let me see what your setup is. They, they had set up their CP, their command post here. Right next to it was all of their generators and fuel. And then right next to that was their antenna farm. Oh. <laughs> like, like within 20 meters of each other. So oh, you had really? your comm shack, you had your CP, your generators with your, your fuel, and your antenna farm. And I'm like, you guys, do you realize that these generators create what's called an electromagnetic field? And this is an E8 that I'm talking to, okay? Yeah. Who's been a reservist this whole time. Is that it creates an electromagnetic field. So when you key that handset, that generator is pulling all of your signal right into that grounding rod. It mm. said, and let me just tell you, you're a, you're, you're a Ford Observer's wet dream right here because all he's got to do is have one well-placed round and he's wiped out everything. Yeah, you your hand farm effective. isn't supposed to be right on top of the fucking where you're set up at. So I, I, I told him, look, you've got to take this. This has got to be outside the berm. You got to take this outside the berm and remote these radios in. So I helped them set that up. But, but those kind of things, and I mean, I could go on for hours about those, <laughs> those little things that, that these guys who are career reservists, you know, I, I feel bad because it's, I think that the Marine Corps is doing a disservice allowing them to do that because they don't have the wrench time in to be able to become proficient mm-hmm. at the job that they're doing. Yeah. And so I, I think it's a huge service i think the the reserves has its place but i really think that um hold on something just happened here i really think that that they should have to spend time uh, active duty first so they become very proficient at their job because let's be honest one week in a month two weeks a year is not enough time to get proficient at what you're supposed to be doing i mean we wouldn't do that in any yeah. other career field right yeah. you're a machinist working at home and you worked one week in a month, two weeks a year, like that's not enough to be putting airplanes in the sky. No, when I, you know? Uh, so, I know exactly what you're talking about. When I deployed in 2009, I was with, um, I, I was with, um, for or second maintenance battalion. And the, but I, when I deployed, they attached me to second supply battalion for the deployment. But then second supply battalion was reinforced with all these reservists. So it was basically like half the unit was us active duty guys and half the unit was reservists. And, there were some good reservists, but there were a lot of shitty reservists. You know what I'm saying? And like you said, like they didn't know their job and it's not, and we gave them a lot of, a lot of shit about it and stuff like that. But it's like, it's kind of not their fault because if they, when they go in for their one yes. week in a month, you know, they're doing fucking annual training, yeah. SARP classes, bullshit, instead of doing actual training. I understand, you know, the that, whole point, right. the reserves, right. The problem is, is if we're going to, if we're going to utilize the reserves like we had, because so during that time, for the people that don't understand is like during that time, the reserves were being deployed all the time. They were in the regular yes. rotation. It's not like now, like right now, the reserves aren't really, there are reserve units. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. There are reserve units deploying and stuff like that, but it's not at the same level that they were then. So if we're going to expect our, at that time, if we were going to expect our reservists to be you know, fulfilling active duty components of the, of the mission. And they should be capable of doing that. And and you're right. We, there was a, I was an actual mechanic. So actual turn, you know, wrench time, these dudes didn't have it. I remember asking a dude, I was on top of an LVS pulling the motor out. It was the first thing I was working on in Iraq. And I got this kid that was working with me and I'm like, Hey man, let me get a three quarter inch socket or whatever. And he, or, or a ratchet wrench. And he comes back with like a half inch breaker bar. He doesn't even know what the tools are. And I'm like, dude, are you serious right now? Like, 
that's not even it at all, you know? And, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it was tough, man. It was tough, but now yeah, I know what I, you're I wanna, saying. I want to make sure, I want to make sure people hear me. I'm, I'm not banging on the reserves. You know, I, I just, um, it's, it's not their fault. It, it, and they have other jobs. The Marine Corps, all the, all the military needs to change when they, when they look at how they're going to deploy reservists, you know, they've got to make sure that they're, they're giving them the tools necessary to succeed. And, and so yeah. I, it, it was, it, it was terrifying being out with the reserve unit and these guys just didn't have the the same level of training that, that you would expect a warfighter to have. And it's not their fault. Yeah. You know, I mean, they may do and they learn really quick, right? I mean, trial by fire, they learn really quick, but I think that's totally unfair to do to these guys to not give them the tools and the training they need uh, to be successful. I think it's a huge disservice. And I think mm-hmm. the military seriously needs to take a look at allowing people to come in and just sign up to be in the reserves. I mean, I know they do it because they want to fill billets and they have readiness numbers they have to get. Um, but man, it really puts the the warfighter at a disadvantage. I believe. Yeah. I don't like that. We, we are almost where we're more about the quantity rather than the quality of people. It's like, dude, we need to really start. Sh- everyone talks about the 10%, oh, the 10%, every unit's got the 10% and they do every unit, even all the way up to the top tier units. There's dudes in those units where dudes look at them and they're like, you shouldn't even be here. And I don't know. I feel like just even down on the regular units, though, that like we need to some. I don't know. I, I've always said that we've we've need we need to make it easier to fire people in the military, like kick people out that are just no good, like get rid of them. The ten percent, you know, that aren't any good. That way, we can train. The, it's they're not hindering the training of the people that are there. That you know that are really good. You know, because you can't only do as much as the weakest guy in your unit. You know, so I don't know. I don't know. I just, I really hated the fact that we couldn't get more people not kicked out, but like, if you're no good, you're no good. Like I, if you're not working, then what good are you to me? Like, why do we have to, why does it take a year to kick a dude out of the Marine Corps? If, if there's something like he's not working, you know, he's not doing what he's supposed to, he's just collecting a paycheck. So I don't know. I don't know why I started talking about that. I just needed to vent. <laughs> so it's a whole nother topic. Yeah. 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 I, uh, what, so that I want to go my, back. I want to go back. So you you just came back in. What'd you do? Just call the recruiter and be like, "Hey, I know the war's going on. Like, I want to come back in." And they're like, "Yeah, that's here, exactly." Right. Yep. I said, "What's the next unit?" They said, six engineers out of Portland." I tell you what. I wish I would have um, uh, had a little bit more forethought into that. But uh, I tried calling Anglico, but they were already gone. They were already mm. in country. So I was like, "All right." My goal was. Attach the first unit I can, get in country, and then find Anglico and go back. Like that, yeah. I'll figure this out. Um, and that didn't happen until the very end of the war. I found Anglico. They were in Camp Commando, but by that time, they were getting ready to – everybody was was heading out. You know, Everybody was getting ready to go back home. We were demobbing, and they were pushing everybody south. The war was over, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, what was you know, that there's like? There's really no reason to attach, What was that like, that? being told, like, hey, we're – the, we we did it like we took over Baghdad. Did you think, oh, okay, so it's going to be done here in a couple of weeks? Like we'll be, everybody will be done, and then here we are, you know, over ten years later. Yeah, I mean they they declared the the, the war over, and so I had a choice because at that time my my actual eight year contract was up, right? So I was I, I was finishing mm. out my IRR time as That's active, right. so it was yeah. super smooth for me to get in. But if I wanted to stay in. I would have had to re up for another contract. So I'm in country and, um, you know, I was, it was funny because I was, I was dealing with mental health issues then and I didn't realize it. And a lot of it had to do with being out there on that line, um, by myself and just listening to that radio chatter, man, your mind plays tricks on you out there. It, it messed me up for a long time. Sleeping still to this day is, is, is really difficult for me. Um, and I know a lot of it has to do with when it gets quiet. When it gets quiet at night, it, it messes with me because mm. I spent so much time out there by myself or just with one other guy, which isn't real great either, you know? Um, That's so crazy. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It, 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 it is crazy. I'm surprised they even let that, that, that even happen. Yeah. That's like nowadays, if, if that was even proposed, people would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, no way. We don't even leave well, one yeah, guy yeah, alone yeah. in 29 Palms here in the United States, you know? You think you think of the tempo that we had, though. You know, we pushed really far, really fast, and so they were making decisions. That's true. Uh, you know, so it 
whatever the the leadership there you know uh like i said i don't want to bash them too much but i i know what happened to me and i know that a lot of the issues that i deal with with ptsd go straight back to those decisions that those leaders made you know that were poor decisions so uh, i don't want to beat up on them too bad but uh yeah man that's that's what happened to me and it was a uh, it was a difficult time uh for sure and it definitely made me have some really hard feelings toward the marine corps when i was getting ready to get out so yeah. making that choice of going home or re-enlisting was very easy for me i'm like i'm getting out of here yes these guys are a goat rope i don't want to be anywhere around this this is dumb i'm out yeah it's the war is not what i thought it was going to be um where it was this like it was in anglico where i thought i'd be around you know, my guys and we'd be on a team and we'd be fighting for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I really felt like an out, and I don't want to say an outcast, but an outsider in that reserve unit because I didn't know any of those guys. They didn't know me. So I didn't have any value really in their life. So it was no problem to put me out there in the desert. And well, the camaraderie is different in a reserve unit because they don't, they're not together every day. They're not living together, they're not working together, they're not, you know, going to the field together all the time. Like, they do their one weekend a month, they stay in a hotel together and they all hang out and stuff and then they come in and do their drill and they do their training and stuff like that and then they go back to their normal job, go back to go back home. And so that that doesn't surprise me. Like what you're saying is doesn't surprise me that you know, you the com it's just the camaraderie is just different in the military because people don't that's what people can never understand. It's like you're you're living and working with the people all it's like you're living in a commune. You know, you're with these people all yeah. day, every day, you know, everything about them, especially if you're in a job like being a Ford observer and you're out on an OP in Fort Bragg for the same OP for two weeks straight, you know, you and four other guys sitting in a hole for four weeks. Like, you know, everything about each other because you fucking run out of shit to talk about. So you just talk about everything. That's right. But, That's uh, right. yeah. Do you, would you do it again though? Would you have done it? Like, are you glad you did it that you came back in? Yeah, you know, yeah, yes and no. Um, I think I would have had a, a I, I went back in out of a sense of um, obligation mm -hmm. to Brian because, uh, you know, here's my friend who 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 died over there, and uh, I felt like I owed it to him at the time to to go and fight, and so, yeah, I, I would do it again. I think I would have been a little bit more selective with the unit that I signed up with. I was just like. Forget it. I'm going. Like, who's the next one shipping out? Yeah. I think I would have been a little bit more selective, but I definitely would have gone um, and and did my part and did what I, I signed up to do. You know, and I mean, I, the the military spent a lot of money training me. I have a very yeah. unique skill set, <laughs> and then uh, so to not use it, I, I felt like was a waste and a disservice to my country. So that's why I I decided to uh, to go back in, and that's just my own personal feeling on it. You know, for other guys who got out and didn't decide to go back in and fight. Like that's their choice, you know, yeah. but for me, uh, I think I made the right choice to go back and to, to fight that. What you said there, that's a hard reality. I think a lot of people come to, you know, come to face and I, I'm one of them where you're like, Hey, you've taught me all these skills. I have all these capabilities. And then they, they send you somewhere and you're like, why the fuck would you send me? Like I got sent to the Mew and I was just like, why are you sending me, pulling me from Anglico? You know, before my time there was even up, they had a hot fill spot that they had to fill a fire chief position at the Mew. Like, why would you send me this dude that's qualified that's a JTAC, a JTAC evaluator, you know, one of like two or three JTAC evaluators on the entire West Coast, or, you know, for the Marine Corps yep. at least. They sent me over there and it's not even a JTAC billet. I had to, I had to, and the command wasn't, some of my actual leadership, like my major and my captain were great. Then they were trying to make sure, you know, I was utilized and stayed busy and I got to do stuff, but they were never there because it's the Mew. The Mew staff gets fucking whored out to go do all kinds of other stuff. So I got sent there and I sat there, I, I got sent there to become a watcho basically to sit there and fucking answer the phone on a ship. And that's why I was like, when they sent me there and I knew that was going to happen because I had done the Mew prior to that. And I saw how the fire chief was at, on that Mew. And I was like, no fucking way, dude, that's a garbage ass job. And when they sent me there, I was like, look, if you send me to the Mew, I'm getting the fuck out. Cause I'm like, how can you, how can you justify sending me there? And then at the same time, put out messages that the Marine Corps is short on JTACs. You're sending one of your, one of your most skilled JTACs into a fucking non JTAC position. And then. Then we then they pulled a kid that was a corporal. They sent a corporal to TACP school. Three of them, three of them went to TACP school because they didn't have anyone to send. And um, only two of them got designated. One of them, I told his company commander because I was the one doing the evals. They were all in the mew with me. 
I'm like, Jesus, you're sending dudes here that aren't JTACs. Now I have to do their evals too. And, uh, one of the kids I told his company commander, I'm like, this kid's not allowed to control air live air at all. Unless I'm there. I was like, I don't care who else is there. I'm the only one that's allowed he, to, he, I have to be there for him to control air. Cause you'll get someone killed. And, um, but anyway, what I'm getting at is it's tough to go to a job where you're not being utilized. You feel like you're underutilized. Yeah. You feel like, why the fuck did I do all that stuff? Why, why did I put in all that time? Why did I do all that training? And here I sit doing nothing, you know? So I know that pain and I know a lot of people out there feel that pain. And that's one of the major reasons why I got out. I think one of the, one of the generals, um, the Marine generals was like, we keep letting good dudes get out and they go on to become civilians and make a million dollars in the, the real world. Cause they're tired of idiots in the military. And, um, I mean, I don't know if there's a truer statement out there, you know? So I, yeah, it, it is a very true statement. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I left the Marine Corps and I was, I was struggling with mental health. Um, uh, like I said, when I was in country and this is, this is the exact brief that they gave us. They had all of our gear lined up, you know, all these, mm-hmm. these rows, all of our gear, and we're standing there, and they're having these, I don't, they weren't MPs, but somebody come by and, like, inspect our gear to make sure we weren't, like, loading live ordnance and stuff onto the aircraft to go home. Oh, yeah. And they had us all stand up. What's that? No, I was saying, oh, yeah, I they, know what they, you're talking about. They still do that. Yeah, so they had us all stand up, and um, I don't know who it was because I was way in the back, but they start yelling, all right, well, if anybody has any mental health problems, if you're dealing with anything, nightmares or PTSD or any crap like that, we want you to fall out over here and, and, and go see Doc, and you'll get your mental health treatment right here in country. For everybody else, grab your gear and get on the bird. Oh, well, I looked really? around, ain't nobody, ain't nobody falling out. Everybody's picking up their gear and Who getting would? on the bird to get back home. But that, that was our um, mental health briefing when I got out of the Marine Corps. That Jeez. was it. And I knew I was struggling then, but I was like, ah, it'll be fine. Once I get back in country, I'm just homesick. I'll be all right. You know, it's just, just here. Um, but man, it didn't go away and it got a lot worse for me. And I didn't understand it because I'm not, I'm not a door kicker, man. I'm not infantry. I'm not, you know, slaying bodies in the street all day. And so when I, when I came home and I was having these problems, I didn't, I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was happening. I went to the VA to try and get help, but it was terrible. The what kind of problems? back then was off. It was, it was just to give you like, um, it was to give you just a bunch of medication that made you feel like a freaking zombie. That, right. that was it. Give you yeah. a bunch of medication and send you home. Like that was the treatment. Yeah. It was terrible. That was a, uh, for a while, that was like the standard that you, you knew that like VA treatment was a bunch of pharmaceuticals, you know, and I'm glad they're starting to kind yeah. of realize how bad of a, you know, a lot of dudes, a lot of dudes became hooked on opioids and OD and stuff because of all the stuff that the fucking VA and everybody was giving them. Um, yeah, there's, um, I don't know. It's crazy. Like that whole, that whole thing is just, it's just wild. I can't believe like some of the stuff you see guys taking handfuls of pills a day to deal with some of the stuff they're, you know, dealing with, you know, and it's just fucking insane. Like that, that no one looks at that at that time and goes, you know what? This is not a smart thing. Like this can't be good. You know, like. That's pretty wild. Yeah, I can't it, believe I can't believe they tried to separate you right there before you get on the plane. Like, hey, if you're gonna stay here. Like, that's insane. Like, um, that's, yeah, that's that's what they did. It, what, it was bizarre. When you say you were having issues, what kind of issues were you are you talking about? So I didn't I didn't know what it was at the time, but um, you know, I'd get home from work and I would sit down uh, and try and watch TV, and I would just feel like I feel like somebody was going to come in the door any moment. Right. Or somebody was already in the house. So I was like, what is happening? So I, I literally couldn't sit down and relax until I cleared my whole house. And I'm talking my whole house. I'm talking I'm opening cupboards under the bathroom sink. And I would play this game with myself or be like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go check that cupboard. I feel uneasy. Like somebody's hiding in there, but I'm not going to do it. And I would sit on the couch, but it would just eat at me and eat at me like I was sitting on a hot coal. And mm-hmm. so I was like, all right, I'm just going to go check. And I checked like, OK, I'm fine. I'd be checking and rechecking door locks. You know, they call it hypervigilance. Um, I started having uh, nightmares, but not realizing that I was having nightmares. Yeah. Until, 
you, you know, so, somebody uh, is, you know, my wife is telling me that, oh, hey, you're you're having some issues when you're sleeping, not knowing that, but waking up exhausted. Uh, I started having audio hallucinations at one point. And I'm thinking, I'm going crazy. Like, what is going on? I don't understand this. So I started trying to go to the VA and get help. But I really, what the VA taught me was that I need to be in control of my own mental health. Mm -hmm. And so I started researching these things on my own, the medication that they were giving me, I would look it up and read about it. And then I'd go back into my next meeting and be like, Hey, look, you guys prescribed me this. These are the side effects. These side effects are exactly the problems that I'm having. So why would I take this, Mm -hmm. this pill and have the exact same side effects? So is there anything else? Well, I've looked at this medication. I've looked at this treatment. Are you guys doing any of this stuff? No, no, no. We don't do any of that stuff. Or, you know, so I really just took control of my own mental health. Uh, I asked a lot of questions when I was in the doctor's office, like, what is this? Why are we doing this? What What are the results? Tell me the case studies that, that have been done on this. And then I'd go back through and I would read these case studies myself and determine like, if this is the best course of action for me or not, which really took those doctors by surprise because they didn't, yeah, they're doctors. They don't want to be you question know, um like there's the authority on, in the room they, yeah yeah so i mean I, I did have some really good doctors but i had some really terrible ones too and i like i said i just learned that i needed to do it on my own and that's that's what i started doing i started reading a lot of books i started learning about how the brain physically operates like what happens when you're having a panic attack learning learning what all these different things were and what other people were doing to to cope with it because ptsd isn't something new i mean it's something that's been around for a very long time civilians deal with it on a regular basis when they dealt with like childhood trauma or or like a robbery or a rape or something like that so it's you know the ptsd uh everybody experiences a different type of trauma but the Mm -hmm. end results are are always the same it's going to be the uh disturbed sleep it's going to be the hypervigilance it's going to be the uh, panic attacks. It's going to be the depression, the anxiety, the suicidal ideations. So no matter how we experience trauma, whether in the military or as a civilian, we're, it's, it all is going to have the exact same effect on our bodies. And so that's what I started learning about. Um, it, it, it was a hard road and I almost didn't make it. I remember in 2009, I almost, um, I was really struggling with, with mental health. I, I, when I came back from Iraq, I ended up uh, getting a divorce, uh, abusing alcohol, and ending up homeless. So I ended up being homeless twice in my life. And then I started getting it together a little bit, dealing with my mental health, but I was still really, really struggling. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I almost committed suicide. I, I drove to this empty parking lot. It was a warm July day. And I parked in this back parking lot. My intention was to was to commit suicide. And I could hear these kids playing in the park. Uh, across the fence and so I figured well I'm just gonna wait because I don't want to you know have these kids have to find me or something like that and uh, so I was just waiting to, to for the noise to die down the kids to leave and uh, I ended up falling asleep man and oh, really? uh, when I woke up I didn't have those suicidal ideations anymore and so I just drove off and left and figured all right well I feel better it was about four or five days later I uh, it's probably about a week later I got uh, an invitation to go to church with a friend of mine. And uh, I was like, nah, I'm not really into that church stuff, man. But I, but I went anyway. I tell you what, it was a very eerie feeling to be driving into that very same parking lot that I almost committed suicide in a week earlier. Oh, it was the same place? So, yeah, it was the same. It was the church parking lot. I didn't know it was church at the time. It was a church and a school uh, combined. And then it had a huge playground right there, yeah. uh, that was attached to it, which is where those kids were playing. So, um, yeah, it was a very eerie feeling for me to, to drive back into that. Yeah. Um, but I started going to church and I started listening to what the pastor was saying. He was doing a series on feeling lost. And I was like, man, that's me. I feel lost. And I ended up, um, you know, saying, well, maybe, maybe I can give this Jesus thing a, a shot, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, Maybe this will solve all my problems. And so I, I did the altar call. I gave my life to the Lord, and I thought, great, you know, now all my problems are going to go away. But uh, but that that didn't happen, you know. It, it, there were no uh, angels singing or lights <laughs> coming down, you know. I, I still dealt with all the same things, but uh, I knew that there was something there, uh, and I wanted to learn more about it. So just like I had studied the, my mental health, mm-hmm. uh, I started studying the Bible and reading it and asking questions and going to Bible study, and getting involved and serving in the church uh, to try and stay busy. You know, I would I would volunteer any opportunity I could with the church, do whatever I could. Yeah. And I had a pastor invite me to go to Mexico um, that next spring. 
and build a home for a homeless family. And I was like, ah, I'm good. I don't really want to do that. You know, I've, I've been overseas. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to stay right here in America. But uh, he was persistent and he finally talked me into going on that trip. And I did. I went to Mexico on Memorial Day and I built a home for a homeless family. And so it, it really changed my life uh, doing that. And, and me, like a lot of other guys I know on Memorial Day, I'm going to go spend my time at the bar getting drunk, you know, remembering the guys that I lost. And because mm-hmm. uh, that had been my tradition for years, you know, I'd, I'd put a shot and a beer up on the bar. Uh, and I'd sit there and drink all night with Brian. And uh, when I'd get done, I'd pay the tab and stumble out the door. And that's how I spent my Memorial Day. That's how I'd honor Brian and his memory. But when I went to Mexico and I built that house for the first time with that homeless family, God showed me that there is a better way to honor the guys that didn't come back. And that's to continue serving other people, Mm -hmm. to serve others in life as they had served us in death. If I wanted to really honor them, that's what I'd be doing. So that's what I did. I, uh, for seven years, I went back and built homes for a homeless family every single Memorial Day. And on top of that, I connected with the missions director and I've gone all over the world, uh, building churches and schools and orphanages. Uh, I'm a close combat instructor. So I teach, uh, hand to hand combat to vulnerable populations in Cambodia, Indonesia, Alaska, Honduras. And, um, where was I? Yeah, I think that's all of it. Um, been you use my training you know to, to help vulnerable populations and what i learned during that time and studying how the brain operates is that there's there's healing through serving other people mm-hmm. and i start and i remembered the stuff that i was reading in those those medical journals and those those research studies uh talking about that about this philanthropic idea of of um how when you do service for somebody else you actually get more reward and benefit yeah, than the definitely. person receiving it I believe that so they for do sure. that with salvatory tests and stuff like that. You know, it's really remarkable uh, science. And it's what the Bible tells us as well. You know, mm-hmm. so I had the biblical side telling me uh, what God says about the issue and then science. And, and they really just married up. And so I created a program for myself to overcome uh, PTSD and nightmares and, and anxiety and, and be able to work through that. And uh, it was very successful. Do you ever feel conflict when you're, I'm not like a really religious person. Um, and I don't find any, like anything wrong with religious people. I used to, I was raised Southern Baptist. I used to go to church all the time, all the way up until probably right before I went to high school, you know, and I chose to, like, even when my parents didn't want to, we would get on the church bus and go, you know, to the local church and stuff like that and, and stuff like that. But I, I think mission work is really great. Um, and, I think that's really awesome that you're doing that. But what you said about how you, you know, you take the science and the religious, do you ever, do you ever find conflict in that where like, you're like, Hmm, like this isn't, this isn't coming together like it should. And I'm not trying to question um, your like no. religion, you know, your religion or anything like that. I don't want you to no, no, no. It's, take it's, it like that. No, no, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's totally fine. Uh, actually I don't, you know, I, um, I think that science proves the Bible. You know, uh, honestly, and I mean, I've looked at, I mean, you can nitpick these little things here and there and that's fine. But for what I'm talking about with mental health and how the brain operates, you, you, you read that, um, it, it's all backed up in, in, in scripture, yeah. you know, um, I, I think you're hundred percent to- correct that g- giving back definitely gives more to you. Like you, the rewarding feeling that you get knowing that you did something for somebody else that really needed it is, I mean, I don't know. It, it's a great feeling. It's a hundred percent a great feeling. And I, I, I think what you're talking about and what you're getting at and is that people just need, people need, um, I don't know. They just need something, you know, they need something that they're pushing towards. They need something that they're working towards. So, and that's why I always tell people they should get a hobby, like get a hobby. It's something that interests you that you want to get into. You meet other people, you interact with other people. You're thinking about that rather than the shit you don't want to be, you know, thinking about like, I think doing something, anything is awesome, but I mean, traveling to other countries and, and building houses for homeless people, that's an, obviously an amazing thing to be doing. And what, what do you consider to be, um, what do you consider to be at risk populations? Cause you said you went to Alaska. So like kind of explain that a little bit for me. Well, there, there's a lot of, uh, sex crimes that happen up there in those small villages. And so, the governor of Alaska put on this huge um, 
event for all of the youth in Alaska a few years ago where she flew in all of the uh, the kids from all these villages that are very isolated, flew them all into Barrow, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And we put on like a two week, uh, you know, like kids camp for them. And That's I cool. went up there because they wanted me to teach self-defense to the girls who were at risk of uh, um, becoming victims of a sex crime. Yeah. And so that's what I did. My I took my daughter with me at the time. She was 16. And we went up there and we taught hand-to-hand -hand combat. I mean, I taught them uh, how to use weapons of opportunity and, yeah. and how to be able to defend themselves against a, a, an attacker. And, you know, that's... That's what I did. That was my piece of that whole puzzle was to do was to do that was to teach them uh, to be able to defend themselves against a uh, uh, sex crime. That's awesome. Do you do you ever get feedback from anybody that you've taught? Like, hey, I had to use your, you know, like I had to do this. And yeah. Yes. So I did. Um, it was funny. It's a lady from my church. Actually, we had a big event. So there's some YouTube videos out there because I have these cubatons that I make. Well, I don't make them. I have them made and they've got our logo on them. And so like our awards dinner, our benefits dinner last night, uh, people can buy one. It's a buy one, give one. So it's the Tom shoe model. So they buy one and, uh, it, you know, they're paying for two. And the mm -hmm. other one I take to another country and I teach somebody how to use it. Uh, okay. And so I was at an event and we were doing a different fundraiser and we gave away some of those as a, uh, as a prize. And I told the lady she, she won it for my church. And she's like, what is this thing? How does it work? I said, look, I don't have time to teach you right now, but go on my YouTube channel and you can see there's some videos there. It teaches you exactly how to use it, what, you know, how, how to use it. And so she did. She went on there and she's like, those videos are great. Thank you so much. And then, I don't know, it was two weeks later, um, she sent me this huge email that said that uh, her and her husband were out over the weekend and he went to go get the car. And so she was standing outside and she was actually attacked um right outside the the establishment they were coming out of uh and she had to use that kuba baton to be able to defend herself against these two attackers oh damn what's a what's and a kuba so, baton do you want to explain that for the people that are listening um let me see if i have them so a kuba baton okay this work so a kuba baton is it's it's like a it's a keychain but i could actually use this pin right here as a kuba baton so mine's a solid piece of uh aluminum okay and so it's a self-defense tool, or I call it an advanced pain compliance tool. So I would grip it like this, and then I can use these blunt ends to be able to defend myself against an attacker. Or if somebody was to grab my wrist, I could turn and dig it into the back of their hand or their wrist, put it on soft points yeah. along their uh, their ribs here to get them to move in the direction I want them to. Um, so it's a, it's a motivation tool <laughs> for somebody who is trying to attack you. Uh, I could use anything. I could use this ink pen if I wanted uh, as a Kubaton, but you can you can Google them, uh, put them on Amazon, look up Kubaton, K-U-B-A-T-O-N, um, and it's about six inch long piece of metal. Some of them are, are have an edge to it. Uh, you can get the blunt ones too, it doesn't matter, but it's just a, a tool you can use that looks very benign, but um, can have devastating effects on, a, on an attacker. That's awesome, man. What What do you think is like one of the most effective techniques that you use that you like try to teach to other people like like what's like one of the most basic things because that's i think for a lot of people learning self-defense most people don't want to go do martial arts most people don't want to go to the gym three times a week for an hour hour and a half each time to learn it's great i don't, I don't my I, my kid does it you know he goes to jujitsu three times a week um i get it and i used to do taekwondo when i was a kid nothing crazy you know like a little kid breaking boards and stuff and i think it's it's good stuff but what do you think is like the bare minimum that somebody should know and that they can look up without having to actually research or without having to actually go to get a class. I, I think the most effective tool, uh, in a fight would be an apology. <laughs> yeah. Just don't no, let the honestly, fight happen. Yeah. Honestly, that's, I mean, honestly, I mean, a lot of times our pride gets in the way and like for me, yeah. I mean, I, I have a very unique skill set, and I'm, I'm really good at it. I, when I became a close combat instructor, uh, they told us, if you really want to be good at this, go get a job as a bouncer at the crappiest little whiskey dive you can find. And so that's what I did. And I spent two years moonlighting as a bouncer in San Diego, um, just cracking skulls. And I became really, really good at it. Just cracking skulls. And then when skulls. I moved up here to Washington, <laughs> when I'd move around, uh, I could always find a job as a bouncer. And I'm not a big guy. I mean, I weigh 
you know, I weigh about 170 pounds right now and I'm five, five. So I'm not a huge guy, but, um, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, I weighed like 130 pounds being yeah. five, five. So five, I was five, even smaller. Man. So people look at me, like, you're a passer. Um, but it's because I, I, I was quick and agile and I knew where to hit people and how to hit people. Yeah. But, but more than that, I knew how to apologize and talk my way out of a lot of fights. Cause even though I can, uh, you know, stomp somebody out. It doesn't mean that I, I should. It's still going to hurt no matter what. I don't think I've ever been in a fight where I didn't walk away uh, hurting. And so I think there's a it's a Chris Christopherson song called um, "The Winner." Yeah. So if you guys out there look look that song up, it's an old country song, and it's about this guy who was a bar fighter, and uh, he's talking about he's the winner, you know. And he's like, "Yeah, that that woman over there, my wife, uh, she gets meaner, and I won her in a bar fight." And she gets meaner, meaner and uglier every day. But I'm the winner. There you go. He's talking about, yeah, it's false teeth. Yeah. You know, broken bones. And anyway, uh, so I try and talk my way out of it. You can't always do that. Um, so the second most effective way to end a fight, uh, number one would be an apology. And number two, um, punch him in the throat. Very effective. Very, very effective. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take a lot of pressure. You can either hit him straight on uh, here, but... I really like a uh, knife hand blow. So this this part of your palm right here, and you strike right across the carotid artery. Yeah, It's really cool. It makes their body do what's called a function check. And there's some funny videos you can see online of Marines doing this to each other, uh, just whacking each other right here. And so what it does is it there's a carotid artery. It pushes all that blood up into your brain really quick. And the brain says, wait, there's too much blood. And so it pushes it down the other side really fast. And then there's a gap where there's no blood. Yeah. Because that's where you struck. And then the brain says, wait a minute, now there's no blood? Okay, I'm just going to shut down everything that's not vital. So your circulation uh, and your respiratory are the only two systems that are going to stay online and everything else is going to shut down, hmm. right? And you're going to get knocked out just like that. A lot of times, not every time, a lot of times, though, you'll lose bowel control when that happens. So you'll wet your pants. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, yeah, the guy will wet his pants. And when he wakes up, he lost short-term memory so you know, the short-term memory didn't have or the so you have your your instant memory short-term and long-term the instant memory is like two to three minutes those memories didn't have a chance to get into short-term or long-term so it's basically like when your computer crashes all that data gets wiped out if you didn't save it yeah so when this person wakes up they have no idea what was going on they don't remember anything that happened in the last two minutes totally disoriented great way to to end a fight and not have to sit there and duke it out with somebody. If you can get a strike on the carotid, they're going to go out really quick. Uh, and by the time they wake up, you're long gone, man. And they don't even remember what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say, I'm not advocating for anybody to strike anybody at a bar fucking around. Um, <laughs> what's your background? Like, where did you learn? Like, did, do you have a, a martial arts system that you learned from? Or like, what's your kind of fighting background to, no, I don't know. Like, no, uh, the, the Marine Corps. So um, I used to fight a lot in the Marine Corps. And so the command was like, all right, Q, you like to fight. We're going to send you someplace. You're going to get your butt kicked every day. And I was like, uh-oh. They sent me to a close combat instructor course. Mm -hmm. And so this is when they first started moving to the, the belt system where it was the McMaps training, yeah. where there was a lot of ground fighting um, and the green belt. So I became a close combat instructor. I became the close combat instructor for the unit. When the transition period between Anglico and uh, the Marine liaison element, I became the unit's close combat instructor. Uh, so that's that's so, where my, my martial arts background So you were pre-McMap, and that's when they were doing, like, line training and stuff like that, where they were doing, like, more actual, like, boxing. And, and I, I from what I've been told, because I obviously I came in after that, from what I've been told, the training then was definitely a lot more physical. Like, there was more, like, just straight fighting. Well, like brawling whereas mcmap was trying to like you know try to formalize a little bit throw in some some jujitsu techniques and throw in some like judo techniques you know a couple little things here and there but try to like really formalize it into an actual martial arts um so it, you kind of saw both sides of that what do you think uh what do you think about it was it was it more physical like pre mcmap like what was the training like then for those that those of us that don't know so the line training was very blocky. 
it felt very much like karate kid, you know, very blocky. Like you do these set of motions, these set of motions, these set of motions. And so they taught you in these blocks Mm -hmm. and McMap was not like that. I mean, it was scrappy. It was literally, they had this big sign on the wall that says he who does not cheat remains in the house of pain, which meant there is no fair fighting. If you got to bite somebody to get out of a lock, you bite them, you eye gouge them, you fish hook them, you kick them in the nuts, man, whatever you got to do. I mean, that's what they taught. So I was in that period where they were first ramping up the McMaps. So I was one of the first classes to go through that when they were still developing that whole process. So I don't know how many belts there are now. I think there's a bunch of them. But when I was in, there was tan belt, mm-hmm. green belt, green belt with a red stripe, and then black belt. And that was it. They added so, a, there's tan, gray, green, or yeah, tan, gray, green, brown, and black. And then once you hit green, you can become an instructor. So you can get a tan tab and that'll carry all the way through black. Or you could become a, I think it's an IT, an instructor trainer where you get the red tab. And then from there, you can get like multiple red tabs depending on, you know, different levels of doing McMap. Yeah, that's that's far beyond where, where I was at. Like I said, I was in the beginning of it and I loved it. I mean, it was 30 days. It was very physical. You were fighting mm-hmm. every single day. So they, where are you at? Like Flack and Kevlar, they would get you exhausted and then they'd put you on the mats to fight. So you couldn't use strength. You had to use technique. You yeah. had to use technique. Yeah. You, couldn't, you, you couldn't just use strength. And so it was really good training. I, I really uh, appreciated it. And it was a lot more fluid training then then the McMa- then the uh, line training was you know i remember in the marine corps the line training you know ready two ready two you know all those little formalized things and when we got into mcmap it was a lot more of these are the these are the tools you figure out how to use them you two you start fighting you know and that's what they would do they put two guys back to back and then blow the whistle and and whatever skills you had you were using to try and submit the other guy yeah and so that I thought was a lot more realistic than um, than the line training was. I think the the thing about McMap, everybody hates McMap. Every no one likes McMap that's in the Marine Corps, and I think it's because that the system, the the training isn't used or isn't done the way it was supposed to be as intended. It becomes okay. You got to get your tan belt out of boot camp, which is very blocky training, like you were talking about before, because you're you're learning the very basics. You're learning like the eye gouge. You're learning how to stand. You're learning how to fall down. You know, shit like that. Um, and then you go and get gray belt, which for me, my my two instructors had just finished instructor's course the day before. Or that Friday. They graduated from instructor's course that Friday. And we were their first class on Monday. So they had just got done getting their ass kicked, like you said, for a, week, for a month. Excuse me. Um, and it's legitimate. Or at least it was when I was in. Because I remember one of my buddies went to that course. And he was talking about how... His final day, like he, he said, he came in and like opened the door and just laid down inside of his house. He didn't even like close the door. He didn't even go all the way to his bed. He just got into the house and just collapsed on the floor and just fucking passed out. But those dudes came and kicked our yep. ass, you know. And but the thing is, is that it's never sustained. That's part of the problem. Is it's supposed to be sustained? And a lot of guys look at it and they look at the UFC and they're like, oh, that would never work. This would never work. You, why would you do this? But guys see the UFC. I don't know. Let me let me pull back on what I'm saying. What I'm trying to say is that guys look at the at McMap like it's not going to work, but they don't think outside of the box of like this isn't the UFC. We're not trying to get this dude to tap out. We're trying to kill him. Like that the end state here is I'm just trying to kill this fucking dude. So whatever you got to get to to kill him, you know, we're just trying to teach you the most efficient way to do that, you know. And I don't think guys understand that they see it as just fighting. Like I'm just grappling with my buddies kind of deal. So it becomes stupid and you're just like, uh, and you also get the, the headquarters Marine Corps has tied in like, well, there's tie in. So let's do these like techniques. And we're going to sit down and discuss drinking and driving. You know, that's become part of McMap training. Uh Uh, and and you're just like dude this is yeah. so fucking stupid and it becomes it becomes like that where you're like dude i don't want to do this like it's not whereas where it should be like hey we do make map one day a week or two days a week every week that's just part of our pt program but it's just every such friday is what we did but the people that are running it i think it's so dis dis 
like disjointed in the in the actual fleet that a lot of guys just don't like to program because they see it as all right, I just got to get my next belt to get promoted. And and the other thing is, there's dudes that become instructors that will sell you a belt. Like they'll you can give them a hundred bucks and they'll write the certificate saying that you did the hours for your fucking like green belt or whatever, you know. And it's just like it is what it is, you know. So that's that I think I think that's the issue with the you're McNabb only and the cheating yourself at that point, you know. For sure. Yeah, no, one hundred percent for sure. I think I, I I believe the same thing. Um, getting out and doing it, I I think grappling's fun. I mean it, it'll fucking wear you out. It'll tell you how sh- how good a shape you are, for sure. So I don't know. You got anything else on I've fighting you want to talk about? No works. Well, yeah, I was gonna say with just one last thing on the McMaps is I, I've had to use it in real world experiences, you know, and. Um, I didn't have to think about what I was going to do. I just reacted to the situation. Mm-hmm. You know, it was muscle memory, you know. Yeah. So those guys who are doing that, who are paying for their belts, like you're just doing yourself a disservice, you know. Because um, I've had to use that in real world situations, not as a bouncer at a bar, but in real world situations, and been able to to survive, you know, with dudes that were trying to do me serious bodily harm, you know, and not even having to think about it, just reacting to what was going on. And I uh, was able to, to survive. So, yeah, uh, it's unfortunate to hear that people are doing that for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's, like, yeah, man, I don't think it's widespread or anything, but it does happen. I know 100% that it does happen, but it is what it is. But, yeah, I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the, you know, Q missions and, and uh, Operation sure. Restore Hope, what yeah. we do. So, so learning about uh, – you know, I said I created a program for myself, and and, and that was my goal, and, and – I was using it and doing well, and uh, then God called me to lead other veterans onto the mission field and show them the same healing that I found. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, I was like, I don't want to do that, right? Like that seems like a lot of work. I had already started a janitorial company, um, so I'd done a startup, and and that was difficult. I think I had like forty or fifty employees at the time. Oh wow, that's cool. Um, and I was struggling just to, just to do that, you know, just to maintain that. Um, but I ended up do, I ended up doing it. I ended up uh, taking a team of, of veterans who were struggling with PTSD down to Mexico, and um, in two days we built a home for a homeless family. And I saw these guys just light up and come alive, and you know work together as a team. Um, it was amazing, and I was like, "Wow, okay, this works for more than just me." And so. A year later, I was I take a trip every year, and so I was like, "All right, well, I need to formalize this and make it an actual program." So I started pouring through like all my old journals and like, "What did I do to help myself?" Because I realized like I couldn't just take these guys uh, to Mexico and have them build a house. I've got to teach them the process, right? Teach them this process of healing through serving others. And so I did. I wrote a little book. Um, let me grab it real quick. So I wrote this little book and I, I self-published it. Um, it was called The Warrior's Guidebook. And so uh, it's just filled with some stories from my life and uh, some biblical principles and then the science behind it for every element that I teach them, uh, how the brain operates. And uh, what we have is called a negative bias. So if you and I have a negative interaction, it's going to take uh, seven positive interactions just for us to get back to neutral, mm. right? Not even to start developing friendship, but seven positive. So if we have, we meet and we have a negative interaction, it's going to take say, seven positive interactions for us to just get back to neutral. Mm-hmm. That's just how our brain operates. And so knowing that, uh, when we're talking about trauma, guys who go overseas, like I did, uh, I, I had an aversion to, to traveling back overseas. Like you talk to any combat vet and they're like, no, nah, I don't want to get on an airplane. I don't want to go to a third world country. Like I don't want to do that. Right. That's what the majority of guys say uh, because there's negative uh, feelings and emotions attached to that. And so what I do by, by taking them and uh, to Mexico and we build a home for a homeless family. Now they have a positive interaction uh, with other veterans being overseas because i run it just like a deployment you know mm-hmm. they get a workup they get briefing i put them back in squads so now they're having positive memories to um to bring their mind back to to neutral so i'm literally teaching them how to rewire their brain with these positive interactions that they're having overseas and with each other friends and family and i teach them 
not just how to do that, not just how to do that there on the mission field, but how to do it when they get back home with their other relationships that they have. Um, you know, like GI Joe says, right? Knowing is half the battle. For sure. So I, I, I I run that. I run that program with great success. Uh, we received a couple different awards from the Department of Veterans Affairs for the effectiveness of our program. And in 2017, 2017, maybe 18, 2017, I think um, I was named Seattle's hometown hero oh, that's for, the, awesome. for the program. So yeah, it's been it's been a great success. That's our flagship program. Uh, and then from there, guys can qualify to go on other missions like to Cambodia, Kenya, Honduras, Haiti, all these other stuff that, that we do. But they've got to go through that first. That's like their boot camp, where I teach them the basics yeah. of healing through service. And then when they get back home, I plug them into other uh, other nonprofits or places where they can continue serving to continue to heal, to continue to rewire their brain. Mm -hmm. And the number one requirement, well, there's two requirements for you to go on mission with me. One, you have to go through Operation Restore Hope. Right? You have to do that first. And then the second one is you have to be volunteering somewhere. It can be with my organization. It can be with your church, the Boys and Girls Club. Like I don't care where you volunteer, but you have to volunteer. And then you submit your hours to our uh, coordinator, our volunteer coordinator, and she tracks it. So I'm, I'm like, all right, I got four slots that I'm going to take over to Cambodia. I put it out there, and guys will apply to go who've gone through the program. They'll apply yeah. to go. And the first thing I I pull their volunteer hours. If I've got 10 guys that want to go on this trip, I stack rank you depending on where you're volunteering. And the guys that have the most volunteer hours, those are the guys that get to go with me. That's so, pretty wild. How many of these trips have you done? Me, total? Oh. Or how many have you set seven, up for, for these other guys? I've probably done over 40 trips myself. Oh, shit. Um, Damn. Yeah. I've probably done over 40. Like, I'd have awesome. to sit down and count it. I've probably done over 40. Um, trips? What? I don't know. I've put 100. So I know I don't know how many trips I've done, but I can tell you some other stats. Like I've put 148 guys on mission. Um, I've put 148 guys on mission. I've built one. So just as an organization, not counting all the stuff I did prior, but just as Q missions and taking veterans, I've built a children at risk center in Cambodia a bathroom facility, two houses over there, six houses in Mexico. I've built 25, I've dug 25 wells. Um, when I say I, I mean us as an organization. Yeah, teams. yeah. We've, we've 25 wells. We built a church uh, on the Amazon River, which was amazingly cool, dude. It was That's really wild. cool. I've never, I've never been to South America. Yeah, it's it, it was cool. I, I've been a couple times. Uh, let's see. There's a bunch of other stuff I've done, but that's 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 some of some of the stats right there, right? Like those are the things that we do. Um, is what, we we what take place? What, what's your favorite stuff, place to go, go to? Uh, me, Mexico, yeah. absolutely. So I'm I'm, hit, I'm Hispanic. Uh, so yeah. last name's Quinones, right? So I know I don't look Mexican, but I'm half Mexican, and um, you know it's just. It's my heritage down there. I love tacos. You know, I love the people. I really love the people. Um, number two would be Cambodia. I mm. absolutely love Cambodia. Uh, and I've learned their history about the Khmer Rouge and, and the, the trauma that the people have experienced over there. And so two years ago, I became a certified public speaker, trainer, and coach through John Maxwell. He's one of the top leadership coaches in the world. And so I became a certified trainer and coach with him. And I've developed my own curriculum uh, for the book. Uh, it's, so this this is the book that I self-published just for the guys, but a publisher uh, called Redemption Press, they picked up my book and it'll actually be published like you could buy it on Amazon. Oh, sick. Um, in when does that come out? April 5th. Oh, okay. April 5th. April 5th, I think it comes out. Uh, and so it teaches, anybody can pick it up who's dealt with trauma, can pick it up and learn these same skills that I'm teaching veterans. And then there's a pathway for them to come on mission with us. So I'll run two separate missions, one for veterans that I supplement. You know, I fundraise for that. So it's a, a low bar for guys to go through. And then I run, I will run a civilian version, which mm -hmm. they'll pay full price for. So about two grand to go down and, and do this mission uh, with us. That's about what it costs. Like I said, I fundraise for the veterans. So all they have to do is pay the $500 for their plane ticket. And then they can go uh, on mission with me and I fundraise for the rest of the money. So, um, yeah, so the book's coming out and that'll be uh, a, a pathway for anybody to learn these things that, that 
we found are successful with uh, overcoming trauma. Is there anywhere that people need to know about or can know about for like maybe if they want to donate to your program or anything? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So qmissions.org. So the letter Q and then missions, M-I-S-S-I-O-N-S dot org. There's some great videos on there. You can look it up on uh, YouTube as well. You can look us up on YouTube. There's some cool videos that show you what we do. So that's, um, yeah, come on mission. So if, if any of you guys out there are struggling with PTSD or if any of this is has resonated with you uh, and you want to learn more, go, go to our website. Uh, you'll be able to, to get the book there. You'll be able to also sign up to go on mission with us. Uh, if that's what you want to do. Um, there's some other good resource tools there too. There's some cool videos for you to watch and you get to show, you get to show the, uh, and you get to see a mission take place in about three to five minutes. You get to see that. And then we had a documentary film crew come with us a couple years ago and they, they did a whole like 50 minute documentary on, uh, on, we call it Operation Restore Hope. They mm-hmm. did a whole 45-minute documentary on that. And actually, that is on Amazon Prime right now. It's oh, really? really cool. Is it for uh, free or is it for sale? Only, no, no, no. It's for free. free. But it's yeah. only in Europe. Ah, oh, you have to have a VPN. In, so, so, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're trying to get it over here in the U.S., but the U.S. doesn't like the closed captioning that we put on it. So we're trying to work with them right now with like, okay, well, what do you – What's the problem with it? They want it in a different format. It's a or documentary. Something. So we're just trying to. It's a documentary about U.S. What's veterans, that? but it's not available in the U.S. Trust me, I I know, I get it. I'm like, <laughs> what? That's crazy. Yeah, I I know, I know. It's, it's, it is crazy. Uh, it's a great documentary, though. Um, so yeah, if you do have a VPN, you can definitely watch it. Uh, on Amazon. It is for free. It's for zero dollars. You know, we want to make it free. I just want to get the, the message out there. And then, like I said, there's a book that goes with it. And then I created an online curriculum as well mm-hmm. on a platform called Udemy. So U D E M Y, Udemy. It's an online course that you can go on. It supplements the book. You don't need the video series, you can just read the book. But if you read the book and you're like, hey, I want to actually teach this curriculum to a, a small, um, you know, like a, as a small group at a church, or if you want to teach it uh, to maybe some some guys that you're friends with, like in the VFW, you want to go through the book together. I created this video series uh, to help you be able to do that, to teach it like a small group. So oh, okay. that, that information. Kind of like you got your hands on a little bit of everything, man. I do. I do. And there's, there's one more piece. And I think this is what Leo, um, is funny because Leo and I, we, we spent uh, a lot of time in Anglico together. And, uh, uh, I was out in Missouri promoting, I built a suicide prevention app and he saw me on the news and that I was in Missouri and where he lives. And he was like, what the heck are you doing out here? Q? Like, <laughs> this is incredible. So we call it, um, operation pop smoke. So you can go to operationpopsmoke.com. It's a suicide prevention app that you have on your phone, and it's utilizing military battle tactics with emerging technology to create the very first suicide prevention tool um, for a mobile app. And so when we built it, we built it. It doesn't it doesn't uh, prevent suicide, but what it does, or it, it, it doesn't uh, prevent mental health issues, but it can prevent suicide. We look at it as a first aid tool, just mm-hmm. like CPR the Heimlich or the AED system. Uh, The reason that those systems work to save a life is because it puts the power to save a life in the hands of the person that's closest to the victim. And Operation Pop Smoke does the very same thing. It puts the power to save a life in the hands of the person closest to the veteran. And how it does that is that you'll have a group of four guys, like a squad, and everybody will download the app and join the same squad. Now, if this person is, is dealing with some depression that day, uh, he doesn't have to, who am I going to call? What am I going to do? He can push one button, the white smoke, and it sends an alert to everybody else that says, hey, you know, this guy is, uh, Aaron's, Aaron's struggling today. So let's just check in on him and, and make sure he's doing okay. Right? So everybody's huh. going to be checking in on him. It it's opens up a concept. chat feature so you can see What's that? I said it's an interesting concept. Right. So they'll be instantly able to, to pop up a chat feature and be chatting. So if this guy's in major distress, he's feeling suicidal, homicidal, going to use drugs or alcohol, he can push a second button, which is red. And so the red button sends the same alert out to these guys, but a higher priority. Mm. It pops up on their phone like an Amber Alert and says, hey, Aaron's struggling. 
Uh, and even if I don't answer up or don't respond to any of their messages, it doesn't matter because it turns on my GPS uh, locator automatically. And so these guys can find me even though uh, I'm not communicating. And so we developed this because I'm working with veterans who are dealing with mental health and maybe I get a phone call from them or their spouse or like a text message that's concerning, but nobody knows where they're at and mm -hmm. they're not responding. So now we're doing literally a grid by grid search of the city trying to find this guy. So this way, when they push the button, uh, we'll be able to go directly to, to their location. So it's available on the app store right now. Uh, it's 15 bucks for, for the subscription. It's a yearly subscription. It's a dollar 25 a month. Uh, people kind of get upset that I'm charging for that, but I tell you what, it cost me a hundred thousand dollars to build this thing out. Oh, Plus, really? Jeez. I've got to continue. And yeah. The apps are not cheap, dude. It's not cheap. I was thinking about that um, yesterday, how much it would cost. I was like, I wonder what it would cost. Cause I don't know how to build an app. I'm not a programmer. I'm like, I wonder what it would cost to, if I had a really good app idea, who I would go to and what it would cost to get it made. That's crazy. Yeah, I had no idea it would be that, but I mean, that's what it cost. And so, uh, I have a team of guys that work with it, you know, who do marketing and PR, uh, administrative stuff. So, I mean, I have a whole, I did a whole nother startup company basically. And right now everybody's just working for free because the app just came out in December. So it, it doesn't make enough revenue to pay for itself yet. But, um, there's more people coming online every day. I have a Marine Corps unit that contacted me. They have 2,600 members and they want to basically bulk buy this. And so we're working with, uh, the play store and with Apple right now. To where they can um, basically, instead of everybody paying one at a time, a dollar twenty-five a month, where they can just bulk pay for it and get sent to them with these with these access codes. So we're working with Google and with Apple to do that right now for these guys. So it's it's really cool. There's uh, people have found tremendous value in it. There's actually a hospital uh, out of uh, North Carolina that found our app and fell in love with it, and so they're partnering with us right now to build a civilian version of the app to where it'll be available to anybody who comes into an ER who is feeling suicidal, they'll be able to, to give them this app. So the hospital venture group wants to partner with us to build out this version. And then they're going to pay for a six month long study with 500 people to quantify the results of the app because their goal is to get it cons uh, considered as a medical device that way insurance will pay for it. So oh, a doctor cool. will write a prescription for this thing, just like they would for a, um, uh, Advil or something like that. Right. I mean, it'll be, it'll, it'll be a medical device categorized as a medical device. So they can just write a prescription mm -hmm. and they can get it. And then the insurance company takes care of it. So that's where this thing is going, man. It's pretty exciting. Um, you can check it out. Operation pump smoke.com and the name. So the name people are like, why'd you call it that? It's like, I don't know, man, I'm an FO. And so if I'm going to pop smoke, calling a nine line for a medevac i'm gonna pop a red smoke i'm gonna throw it on the uh, on the battlefield and that's gonna tell the bird where the casualty collection point is and they're gonna land and drop off ammo and pick up the casualties and they're gonna be on their way so like i said when i first developed it it was just for veterans and um uh it'll be called something different when we build it out for civilians i'm sure it'll operate the same but it'll just have a different skin a different look and feel so that's cool man well you know it, i some you're gonna get haters for it. No, whatever. Who cares? Uh, you know, if you can help anybody with it, like you can't be mad about it. You know what I'm saying? Like if it's helping people, then it's helping people. That's that's the end state. You know, as long as it's helping people, and maybe at some point, you know, your organization's making enough money where the app becomes free. But people, it's funny how people expect everything to be free just because they're used to corporations that can afford to give out free stuff. But when it's like the small dude, the individual trying to do stuff, it's like, dude, you gotta. You know, these guys are trying to survive, you know, live life as while they're doing these other things. So to to be mad that they're trying to make some money to like buy dinner, <laughs> you know, it's kind of ridiculous. But the the fact that you're helping people and that you're getting good feedback, you know, that's awesome. Um, what do you think's next? Yeah, you then? know, you know, it's funny. The on on the haters, you know, it really bothered me for a long time. The the most the, the most the most haters I got. For, for the app were, were other veterans. And it actually came from the VFW here in Washington. I'm a lifetime member of the VFW. And so there's a group of guys 
uh, in the VFW that kind of started their own little clique. I don't even know because I don't get into the politics of it, but they call themselves the Crazy Eights. So it's this group of this subgroup inside the VFW here locally uh, that are real vocal. And those are the guys who are bashing me online and saying all kinds of derogatory things to me. And uh, I was like, man, I'm getting hate from my own guys. Like, what the heck? You know, but these guys, they're sad, pathetic little people, you know, in their own minds. And so they want to make everybody else miserable around them. Um, everybody has so a voice just, online, you know. You know? It, be, oh, yeah, they're tough guys online. But trust me, I saw these guys at a parade, the the local um, Veterans Day parade, and I walked right up to them and introduced myself. And, of course, you know, is that the little chicken hearts like they are, they didn't say nothing. They just kind of walked away. That, so um, that, that kind of feeling – is kind of I think what keeps some people away from going to like the VFW or stuff like that. You know the SVOs, the service or veteran service organizations, the VSOs, um, stuff like that. I think is what drives younger people away from it. Like those organizations are all struggling because they they don't have membership. All, even though we've been at war for the last twenty years, so there's plenty of people that could be members, but people don't want to get involved in something that's just like it's going to add more drama to their life. You know so. D- do you think that's like a common thing? Is it very clicky within the V? I'm not, I was, a, I got made a member of the VFW when I got back from Afghanistan from my second deployment. They, my local one, um, you know, signed me up for free and I just never renewed it cause I was still in and I wasn't going to this stuff. I've thought about joining since I've been out, but I don't know. Do you think it's worth it? You think joining the VFW and stuff like that's worth it? You know, here, here's what I've learned. The, the, um, the people that I've had the biggest problem with, are the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. It's like they've got this chip on their shoulder and they go in this organization that's been around for, you know, 100 years and they go in there and they're like, well, we're in charge now, we're going to take over. And they show no respect to the guys who've been there keeping that place alive mm-hmm. for generations, you know? They they totally um, uh, disrespect the leadership that is there. It's the guys that I've seen. I don't have any, the, the older generation um, some of them just don't get it because they don't understand the technology that I'm presenting, mm-hmm. but I don't get any pushback from them. They all are supportive. They're like, yeah, man, you're out there doing stuff. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Keep keep going. What can we do to help? The guys that that I've had problems with are the younger generation, the Af- my generation of guys and below. We're all haters. Um, the guys that, that have a chip on their shoulder that think that they know best and screw everybody else and we're going to do it our way and we're going to do this hostile takeover of the VA or the VFW. And I'm just like, who do you guys think you are, man? Like you're, you're nobody, you know, you need to, you, you need to show respect to the guys who've been here mm-hmm. keeping this thing alive. And if you want to make change, great, go do something. Don't tell everybody else what they need to do. Mm-hmm. You go start doing something. Yeah. Doing something better that's than successful. Like, yeah. So that, that, that's the generation that I've had problems with is the younger generation and um, not, not a real huge fan of, of those guys. They are very entitled. Um, the ones that I've, I, the ones that I've dealt with in the, in the VFW, I'm not saying they're all like that. Yeah. The ones that I've dealt with, um, you know, these are guys that, uh, I, I, I honestly don't know what their problem is. You know, I could, I could guess, you know, what their problem is, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. They're, they're not going to have any success, uh, in life if they continue that kind of attitude where they're just going to walk in and take over and, you know, it's our time now and we're just going to do whatever we want. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I, I don't know if that's like that. It's other VFWs in the world. I just know that the one that I have out here in Washington state is in complete disarray and turmoil uh, because of this group, the Crazy Eights. They are a miserable group of, of individuals who just disrespect and disregard the leadership uh, and anybody else. I mean, they, they're making all kinds of derogatory um, comments about me online, about how I'm making money. I'm trying to make money off of the backs of suffering veterans. And then I'm going to uh, uh, take that money and, and uh, in, uh, what they say, launder it through my private nonprofit. And so they said all these horrible things that have a hint of truth because they did ask me, well, what are you going to do when this starts making money? I said, well, I'm going to do what I do with my other corporation, my janitorial company. We fund Q missions where we help veterans overcome PTSD. Mm-hmm. So they took that. And they twisted it and created this whole other narrative, all because I wouldn't give them my intellectual property. So what they wanted is they wanted me to show them my business plan and um, the the scope of work for the app. That's what they wanted to see. 
They wanted to see that stuff. And when I refused to give it to them, I said, look, I'm not asking you guys to be investors in this. I just want to share it with you guys so you can download it. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to try. um, And these guys who were officers in the BFW, they wanted to try and intimidate and coerce me into giving up my intellectual property, which is a felony. Right. Let's be real. It's a felony trying to do. Uh, so I went to the leadership of the VFW here in Washington and they said, yeah, we've been having problems with this group. And it was this whole political thing that I really didn't want to get involved with. But um, it, yeah, so so like I said, the most hate that I've gotten have been from my own generation of veterans uh, through the VFW, which I'm a lifetime member of. And it's just, it's crazy when, when you think about it. This generation, we're all a bunch of assholes. You know, we grew up on memes <laughs> and making fun of each other and fucking... And it's, you know, what's, what's funny is that, um, I'm on a couple different veterans, Facebook pages and you see guys post something and everyone just fucking dog piles on them about, you know, you, your deployment's not real. You didn't do shit, blah, blah, blah. And then the next post will be someone talking about doing 22 push ups a day, you know, to talk about veteran suicide. It's like, dude, like dogging somebody about their service is like one of the reasons dudes are killing themselves because they feel like they didn't like measure up to what they, what was in their own mind and what they thought that, you know, this is what I thought the Marine Corps was going to be. And it actually turned out to be like this and it's not what I thought. Now I'm, you know, whatever, you know, they're this, it's everybody that's been in the military knows the story, but knows that kind of story. But I think, you know, it's all, it's all fun and games to talk shit to people. Everybody should be able to freely talk shit to everybody, but some people don't understand the line, don't have common decency. You know, they just want to, some people are just gross people, man. You know, it's just one of those yeah. things. I see I, uh, an example on one of the Facebook pages I was on, like right after the Las Vegas shooting happened within, within an hour, not even an hour. I was on Facebook and I was on that page and they were already making memes, making fun of it, you know? Which is, and guys are like, that's just our sense of humor and stuff. It's, you just got to understand it. And I'm like, I guess, man. I mean, if you want to laugh at something like that, ha ha, like good on you, whatever. But that's just, I think you're fucked up. Honestly, I think you might want to talk to somebody. Like if that's, if that's the kind of stuff that, ooh, you're super edgy, you know, like look at you, super edgy guy making fun of that kind of situation or uh, a veteran that something's wrong with them. That's no fault of his own, you know, and they're, they're struggling through something, but you're going to give them shit about it. You know, it's like we're assholes, you know, it takes all kinds to make the world go round and the, and the military is a uh, direct ref- reflection of society. So the military has a bunch of assholes, a bunch of fucking, you know, there's a percentage that are pedophiles. There's a percentage that are fucking criminals. There's a percentage that are whatever you want to see. We're all there. But uh, overall, majority are good people. But most right. of us are still yeah, assholes. I, I, I agree. While we're still good people. I, I agree. I, I, I tell people, I, I don't even, uh, I, I don't let the haters get to me anymore, you know. I just, the, the best revenge I can get on those guys is to be successful. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, I, I run a very successful program but it's guys like that that kept me quiet for so long and not wanting not wanting to share because i don't feel like my deployment was much of anything you know i didn't i didn't get um you know uh, I'm, I'm not a highly decorated warrior i'm not a um war hero you know i don't have all these cool medals and stuff like that i don't have a really remarkable combat career you know uh, i went and i did my job and i came home like i, I don't have any glorified war stories i can tell you a bunch of funny stupid stuff that happened right but i don't have any glorified stories that people write books about like i I didn't have that kind of experience and so for a long time dealing with ptsd i was afraid to tell anybody about it because uh i felt like i didn't deserve to have ptsd like why am i dealing i didn't earn my ptsd fuck it's like yeah my deployment was was nothing compared to some of these other guys like and that held me back for a very long time but what god showed me was that that he's, you know, God showed me that, yes, I, in my mind, I had a very limited combat experience, but the problems that I'm having are real. I'm not malingering, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not faking the funk here. Like what I'm dealing with is real. The nightmares, the panic attack, the anxiety, the depression, like I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst of this. This is really happening to me. And what God showed me was if, if you and what you believe to be a limited combat experience are having all these negative effects with ptsd how much more are those other guys suffering who do have those impressive war records who have multiple deployments who were kicking indoors they're suffering just as much if not more and so what i learned is that by me speaking up 
and saying something, it, uh, it, it allowed other people to come forward and say, hey, man, me too. I'm struggling with that. What did you do? I'm like, all right, man. Well, here, this is what I did. This helped. This doesn't help. So stay away from this. I don't tell people to stop drinking. I say, as you're going through therapy and as you're trying to get your life back together, stop drinking. Right? You may get to the point where you can have some alcohol later, but if your life is upside down and in turmoil, like just stop drinking for the next couple of years until you can get through that patch. And then maybe you can have a beer every now and then, or maybe you can't. But yeah. for this time, while you're going through this program or this treatment, like just put it away for a little bit. So that way you're not putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound by using drugs and alcohol. So mm-hmm. it, it, it held me back for a long time. And, and what I learned is that there's, and I write about this in my book, there's three camps, basically, when it comes to, to mental health, and I believe. So on the far left camp, you have this person who believes that they're never going to get any better, and they're just a victim of their circumstance, and they take no responsibility for anything that's happened in their life. Um, and that was me for a long time. I lived in that camp for a long time, so I know it intimately. Mm-hmm. And then on the far right side, you have these people who don't believe PTSD is a real thing, that they're just faking it, that they just need to get over it. And if, you know, I hear this in the faith community with other veterans, if you just believed more in God, then you wouldn't have these problems. And I want to punch these dudes right in their neck, you know, Um, because that's just a lie from the pit of hell. (laughs) So you have these these two groups on the left and on the right, but these are minority camps. The majority of people are the people in the middle who are dealing with a mental health issue, but they're still going to work every day. They're yeah. still uh, operating in society, right? But they are struggling. But the problem is these guys in the middle, we're the majority, but we're the silent majority because we don't want to step forward and say anything because we don't want the guys on the right to paint us as the guys on the left, the malingerer, yeah. the faker, you know, He's just a victim of his circumstance. And so they stay quiet. But the reality is that if those of us who are struggling with mental health and we're still surviving and we're striving, when we step forward and we say, hey, man, I struggle with mental health, it changes the conversation. It does two important things. Number one, the guy on the right, it shows him, uh, and this this happened to me many times where people look at me and say, well, you're a successful business owner and you run a nonprofit. Like, you can't be struggling with suicide and depression. I said, I am, man, and this is what depression looks like. I, I struggle with it on a regular basis. It changes their concept of what mental health is. Mm-hmm. And the guys on the left, it gives them hope that, hey, man, if Q can do it and, and he can he can get better and he can get out of this mentality, I can too. And the, the last thing it does is it empowers everybody else who's in that silent majority to be able to be brave enough to step forward and say, hey, man, I, I struggle too. Uh, let's work together to get through this. So that's my advice to to the people who are still listening is to, um, you know, if you're struggling with mental health, just talk about it. You know, let people know. Uh, just start the conversation. I don't think, you yeah, know where it's going to go. I don't think people realize that, like, everybody struggles. You know, everyone has their struggle. Everyone, <laughs> everyone is struggling about something. There's something that, every you know, every day you're going to be like, fuck, I should have done that better. Fuck, that, you know, this could be better. It's just one of those things. Suicide is up, not just in the veteran community. Like we highlight the veteran community so much just because we're veterans one and two, because there's war going on and stuff like that. But suicides have gone up in the veteran community, but they've gone up on every, almost, I think every demographic, you know? And I think part of it is because people are becoming so um, locked into the technology and stuff like that. They're not actually doing anything real. They're not getting outside and doing something real and like interacting with people in a real way. And I think that pullback from, you know, touching humanity occasionally is like fucking with people. I think that's what it is. I think it's just a lot of it. And it, because you get online and people get on Facebook and people get on Instagram and stuff like that. And it's uh, like I said, veterans all dogpile on each other, but so do civilians, you know, everyone talks shit to everybody. It's cool to talk shit to somebody on online. And when you're online all day and you just reading people talking shit constantly and you read the news and the news is only telling you all the negative shit. Cause that's all they want to talk about is negative shit. Cause it gets the most clicks. Like, Everything around you is like negative, 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 negative. And then people are like, I can't believe there's more suicides. It's like, dude, everything around us is saying that everything's negative. Everything's bad. Every week we're told there's a new, something new is going to destroy the entire earth and we're all bad people and that we should have done something better, you know? And it's just like, I don't know. People got to pull back from that bullshit sometimes. That's why I like going out and camping and going out and hiking and stuff and just get away from everything and kind of 
<sighs> take a breath. And when you really look at it and you look around and you go, how has my life been affected right now? Like, how bad do I really have it? And you'd think that veterans would be better at handling a lot of this stuff j- just for the fact that a lot of us have seen like true despair, you know, going to other countries where people are living in, you know, horrible conditions and stuff like that. And knowing that like, dude, my life isn't that bad. America's poor are middle class to upper middle class in a lot of other countries. And that's something we forget. Oh, yeah. Like people bitch about being poor on their iPhone, you know, on whatever app that they're talking on. Like, I'm so poor and life is hard for me. Oh, no. And it's like you're holding up hundreds of dollars in your hand with that phone and you're paying for data. And like, like, and I get it. There are people that are poor and stuff and that's for real. And, you know, I was poor as a kid and stuff. But I don't know, man. It's just like we lose touch. We, are, we lose sight of like what's important and we don't realize how good we actually have it. You know, I got a roof over my house, over my head tonight. You know, I know I have some food in the fridge that I know I can eat. You know, I got my, my wiener dog laying right here. You know, it's these little things that are just so positive in my life. Just food. You know, I have shelter. I have food. I have comfort with an animal here, you know, and I've got my friends and stuff I can reach out to and stuff like that. It's just understanding that that's a positive thing and how good that is to have in your life, you know, and th- that just that basic thing. You know, I don't need the bullshit hanging up on the walls and all that stuff like it's all cool and it's a lot of its memories and stuff but it's all wants and not needs and i think we we forget that and that's why people have mental problems because they start thinking that their needs or or their wants are their actual needs and they're not you know so i don't know it's weird um we'll go and wrap up though I, i appreciate you coming on um maybe this summer we'll have you come back on after your book comes out and um we can see how that's going, see how that's, see what, what you're up to and, um, get an update yeah, right and everything on. like that. Um, if you remind me before your book goes out or before, are you doing uh, pre-sales or anything on Amazon? Yeah, you can, it's uh, available for pre-sale right now on redemption press. So I'll send you all the links to all my media. Okay. Um, yeah, send me the links and I'll put so them in the uh, show notes for the people that are listening. So perfect. So I, really quick, you said you have a wiener dog. Yeah. He's laying right here on the couch. What? Uh, here, I'll, what hold on. I'll get what, what possessed you to get a wiener dog? Dude, they're the best. Oh, come here, Marley. Oh, that's Marley. So what's up, Marley? Uh, <laughs> nah, they're the best, man. He's the second one I've had. I had one. What, why do you like him so much? Um, you know, I don't know. So when I was when I was in high school, my uncle, um. My uncle had one, and my uncle killed himself, actually. And after he passed away, um, I took his dog. And he was a wiener dog. He was a short-haired. And he was just an awesome dog. Like, I lived in Indiana. I lived on the edge of town. Like, my house that me and my buddies uh, moved into, we were all 18. You know, still in high school and shit. We were on the edge of town, and we were, we were the last house on the county line. So there was like literally my, our house and next to us was an apartment building. But behind the house, we had like two acres, like a little field and like a barn and shit. And I had a wiener dog and uh, my uncle's and I would just open the back door and he would just take off and be gone for like hours and come back and bring like a rabbit back or like mice or something that he's out there like, you know, living a dog's life, hunting out in the field behind the house kind of deal. And I remember <laughs> he's super cool. I remember him. Um he would always sniff at the ground and he'd always come back and, and have like dirt jammed in his teeth. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're an idiot. Like, why are you chewing at the ground? And one day he was digging a hole and he was chewing at the ground. And I'm like, I'm just going to watch and see what the hell he's doing. And I watched him dig like six inches into the ground and pull a mole out of the ground. And then I was like, no way. I was like, that was fucking cool. And I don't know, man, I've just, um, they're cool. I like big, I like all dogs. Big dogs are cool, but I live in in the city in San Diego, so I'm I just don't feel it's right to have a big dog in a small place. I feel like if you're gonna have a big dog, you need to have a yard and stuff for him to, you know, play around in and stuff like that. So, and and a, when a wiener dog and when they're little and they chew on something, they don't fuck up. You know, they're not gonna chew a hole through the wall. They're gonna chew like on the edge of the carpet or something because he's he probably weighs 15 pounds, but he's 13 years old. You know, I've had him for 13 years, so. 
He's my he's my little. It's dude. funny. I have a I have a wiener dog too. Oh really? Yeah. Michael yeah, Farrell. She's a, she's Michael Farrell that comes on all the time. He has two. It's wiener dog country. Oh yeah. There. Okay. Yeah. 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 I just I have I have um, uh, she's just a little miniature, so she's only like this big. She's a double dapple. Mm. She's just a little tiny thing. They're uh, but great. She's fantastic. I love it. I'm advocates yeah. for them. And she does too. Like like you said, she'll chase down anything. You know, she doesn't care. Yeah, they're fun dogs. They're really cool. I've thought about, you know, maybe my next dog, since I've had two wiener dogs back to back, maybe I also have a lab beagle mix, um, um, but maybe get a, a corgi, you know, next. I was looking at corgis. I think those are fucking cool too. Those little, little fat ass dogs. They're funny. But I, I like the, I like the short hair though. Um, it, it's, it's a lot cleaner. It doesn't get on your clothes and you know, end up everywhere. Yeah. Which is nice. Well, he's a long hair, but he's not like, he doesn't look like your traditional long hair where it looks like a dust mop walking around. Like he has yeah. longer hair, but his, his hair on his stomach doesn't drag on the floor. Like I've never, and I've never gotten his haircut before. Like he just doesn't, he sheds a little bit, but he's so small. Again, my, my other dog is a lab beagle mix. He weighs almost 70 pounds and which is still not a huge dog, but he sheds fucking everywhere. Like he is just, because he's bigger and this is kind of dog he is and yeah. But yeah, I think everybody should own a dog. I'm a I'm a dog person for sure. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be in San Diego Memorial Day weekend. I I we all fly into San Diego and then I take my team across the border into Mexico. Um Dude, for I'm, Operation Restore Hope. I'm like fifteen minutes from the from the border. Like I'm right here in San Diego. So when you guys come in, give me a call. Maybe we'll link up or something like that. Or on your way back, right. if you guys come through on oh. your way back. That'd be cool to get an interview with you guys once you're done. Well, I'll I'll do you one better. You want to go to Mexico with me? Ooh, when? <laughs> Memorial Day weekend. Friday, <sighs> Saturday, Sunday, I'll have you back on Monday. So we I, leave Friday, we just at the airport, we'd all get in vans and head down. Let me um, let me say let me say maybe. I'm a maybe on that. I have a passport. I'm right here on the border. Um I don't want to commit fully, but I'll I'll put it down as a maybe, and I'll put it on my calendar. That I'm I'm not against it. You know, I'm right here next to the border, and I've never been to Mexico. Like, I've never really? I've never gone across a Tijuana. Like, it's just I don't speak one. I don't speak Spanish, and two. I know it's safe. I know you can go over there, and it's no worse than anywhere else I've been in the world. But there's always that like, oh shit, like what if I go over there and something happens kind of deal, you know? And, and especially now that I'm not in the military. So I think it's different if you get in trouble in another country and you're in the military because they're like, oh shit, we don't want to fuck with him because he's in the military. He's in the US military and it's just going to be bad for him if they fuck with you. Whereas now as a private you know, citizen, if something happens, not even my own fault, like if someone tries to, you know, hustle me over there or whatever. I don't know. I, I really don't want to go over there and fucking deal with like the issues that go on at the border. Cause the border is pretty rough right now. Like the border crossing area is like Tijuana because of the, you know, I mean, you go to Mexico all the time, you know, Tijuana is not Mexico. I, yeah. I go two or three times a year I go. And so for me, got all veterans, exactly what you're saying. Everybody says the exact same thing, right? Like, Oh, I don't know. Uh, Cause what if something happens? And I just, I, I what I tell guys is, if I was going over there by myself, I'd be a little bit more concerned, but there's going to be three vans of 15 combat veterans. If somebody opens up that van door, they're literally oh, yeah, opening yeah. up a can of For that, you know, yeah, for with, something like that, I wouldn't worry. I, I was talking about if I was to go alone or if I was to go with one other person. Oh, yeah. yeah, for you, for you yeah. it's more of a timing thing because I'm in school as well. So I got to make sure that I don't have any like exams that week and shit too. So, but I'll definitely, um, I'll definitely put that down and shoot me that you can email me the details when you send me all the stuff for the, uh, sure. um, the links and stuff for the episode. So, um, last chance you want to throw, you want to go ahead and throw out all your stuff one more time, like your contact info, your website and stuff like that before we, we sign off. Yeah. So, uh, if you guys want to know more about the ministry and the missions work that we do overseas, you look up qmissions.org. Uh, if you want to know more about the suicide prevention app, you can look up uh, operationpopsmoke.com. And if you want to check out the book, you can just search, do a Google search for Healing Through Service. That's the title. And you should be able to find uh, the book on Redemption Press for pre sale right now. 
That's awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you talking about it. Mental health is a, it's an ongoing thing that people just need to understand they're going to be dealing with their entire life. Even if you're mentally healthy now that at any point, right. anything could happen to change that. So being aware that there's resources out there is huge. And I'm glad you're, you're adding another resource to the pile um, of things that people can turn to if they need some help and stuff like that. So thanks for coming on the show and spreading the word. Uh, for everybody out there, check out my website. It's jkramergraphics.com. Um, so, hey, for the people, if if you made it this far and you're listening and you're hearing me talk about my website, the I have a mostly Anglico stuff on there and a bunch of other units. But if you have a unit logo or a team logo or squad, whatever you guys made for deployment or anything, send it to me and I can add that to shirts and hoodies and stuff like that. So make sure to check out, check out my website, jkramergraphics.com and then my Instagram, jkramergraphics. And that's, that's it for the week. That's a, that's a wrap. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good talk to you later. Bye.